the preface of the storm this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by denny sayers in modesto california the storm by daniel defoe a collection of the most remarkable casualties and disasters which happened in the late dreadful tempest both by sea and land the lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet nahum chapter one verse three the preface preaching of sermons is speaking to a few of mankind printing of books is talking to the whole world the parson prescribes himself and addresses to the particular auditory with the appellation of my brethren but he that prints a book ought to preface it with a noverint universi know all men by these presents the proper inference drawn from this remarkable observation is that though he that preaches from the pulpit ought to be careful of his words that nothing pass from him but with an especial sanction of truth yet he that prints and publishes to all the world has a tenfold obligation the sermon is a sound of words spoken to the ear and prepared only for the present meditation and extends no farther than the strength of memory can convey it a book printed is a record remaining in every man's possession always ready to renew its acquaintance with his memory and always ready to be produced as an authority or voucher to any reports he makes out of it and conveys its contents for ages to come to the eternity of mortal time when the author is forgotten in his grave if a sermon be ill-grounded if the preacher imposes upon us he trespasses on a few but if a book printed obtrudes a falsehood if a man tells a lie in print he abuses mankind and imposes upon the whole world he causes our children to tell lies after us and their children after them to the end of the world this observation i thought good to make by way of preface to let the world know that when i go about a work in which i must tell a great many stories which may in their own nature seem incredible and in which i must expect a great part of mankind will question the sincerity of the relator i did not do it without a particular sense upon me of the proper duty of an historian and the abundant duty laid on him to be very wary what he conveys to posterity i cannot be so ignorant of my own intentions as not to know that in many cases i shall act the divine and draw necessary practical inferences from the extraordinary remarkables of this book and some digressions which i hope may not be altogether useless in this case and while i pretend to a thing so solemn i cannot but premise i should stand convicted of a double imposture to forge a story and then preach repentance to the reader from a crime greater than that i would have him repent of endeavouring by a lie to correct the reader's vices and sin against truth to bring the reader off from sinning against sense upon this score though the undertaking be very difficult among such an infinite variety of circumstances to keep exactly within the bounds of truth 
yet I have this positive assurance with me, that in all the subsequent relation, if the least mistake happen, it shall not be mine. If I judge right, tis the duty of an historian to set everything in its own light, and to convey matter of fact upon its legitimate authority, and no other. I mean thus, for I would be as explicit as I can, that where a story is vouched to him with sufficient authority, he ought to give the world the special testimonial of its proper voucher, or else he is not just to the story. And where it comes without such sufficient authority, he ought to say so, otherwise he is not just to himself. In the first case he injures the history, by leaving it doubtful where it might be confirmed past all manner of question. In the last, he injures his own reputation, by taking upon himself the risk, in case it proves a mistake, of having the world charge him with a forgery. And, indeed, I cannot but own, tis just that if I tell a story in print for a truth, which proves otherwise, unless I at the same time give proper caution to the reader, by owning the uncertainty of my knowledge in the matter of fact, tis I impose upon the world. My relator is innocent, and the lie is my own. I make all these preliminary observations partly to inform the reader that I have not undertaken this work without the serious consideration of what I owe to truth and to posterity nor without a sense of the extraordinary variety and novelty of the relation. I am sensible that the want of this caution is the foundation of that great misfortune we have in matters of ancient history, in which the impudence, the ribaldly, the empty flourishes, the little regard to truth, and the fondness of telling a strange story has dwindled a great many valuable pieces of ancient history into mere romance. How are the lives of some of our most famous men, nay, the actions of whole ages, drowned in fable? Not that there wanted penmen to write, but that their writings were continually mixed with such rodomontades of the authors, that posterity rejected them as fabulous. From hence it comes to pass that matters of fact are handed down to posterity with so little certainty that nothing is to be depended upon. From hence the uncertain accounts of things and actions in the remoter ages of the world the confounding the genealogies, as well as achievements of Belus, Nimrod, and Nemrus, and their successors, the histories and originals of Saturn, Jupiter, and the rest of the celestial rabble, who mankind would have been ashamed to have called gods, had they had the true account of their dissolute, exorbitant, and inhumane lives from men we may descent to action and this prodigious looseness of the pen has confounded history and fable from the beginnings of both thus the great flood in deucalion's time is made to pass for the universal deluge the ingenuity of daedalus who by a clue of thread got out of the egyptian maze which was thought impossible is grown into a fable of making himself a pair of wings and flying through the air. The great drought and violent heat of summer, thought to be the time when the great famine was in Samaria, fabled by the poets and historians into the story of Phaeton, borrowing the chariot of the sun, 
and giving the horses their heads they run so near the earth as burnt up all the nearest parts and scorch the inhabitants so that they had been black in those parts ever since these and such like ridiculous stuff have been the effects of the pageantry of historians in former ages and i might descend nearer home to the legends of fabulous history which have swallowed up the actions of our ancient predecessors king arthur the giant gogmagog and the briton the stories of saint george and the dragon guy earl of warwick bevis of southampton and the like i'll account for better conduct in the ensuing history and though some things here related shall have equal wonder due to them posterity shall not have equal occasion to distrust the verity of the relation i confess here is room for abundance of romance because the subject may be safer extended than in any other case no story being capable to be crowded with such circumstances but infinite power which is all along concerned with us in every relation is supposed capable of making true yet we shall nowhere so trespass upon fact as to oblige infinite power to the showing more miracles than it intended it must be allowed that when nature was put into so much confusion and the surface of the earth and sea felt such extraordinary a disorder innumerable accidents would fall out that till the like occasion happen may never more be seen and unless a like occasion had happened could never before be heard of wherefore the particular circumstances being so wonderful serve but to remember posterity of the more wonderful extreme which was the immediate cause the uses and application made from this terrible doctrine i leave to the men of the pulpit only take the freedom to observe that when heaven itself lays down the doctrine all men are summoned to make applications by themselves the main inference i shall pretend to make or at least venture the exposing to public view in this case is the strong evidence god has been pleased to give in this terrible manner to his own being which mankind began more than ever to affront and despise and i cannot but have so much charity for the worst of my fellow-creatures that i believe no man was so hardened against the sense of his maker but he felt some shocks of his wicked confidence from the convulsions of nature at this time i cannot believe any man so rooted in atheistical opinions as not to find some cause to doubt whether he was not in the wrong and a little to apprehend the possibility of a supreme being when he felt the terrible blasts of this tempest I cannot doubt but the atheist's hardened soul trembled a little as well as his house, and he felt some nature asking him some little questions as these. Am I not mistaken? Certainly there is some such thing as a god. What can all this be? What is the matter in the world? certainly atheism is one of the most rational principles in the world there is something incongruous in it with the test of humane policy because there is a risk in the mistake one way and none another if the christian is mistaken and it should at last appear that there is no future state god or devil reward or punishment where is the harm of it all he has lost is that he has practised a few needless mortifications and took the pains to live a little more like a man than he would have done 
but if the atheist is mistaken he has brought all the powers whose being he denied upon his back has provoked the infinite in the highest manner and must at last sink under the anger of him whose nature he has always disowned i would recommend this thought to any man to consider of one way he can lose nothing the other he may be undone certainly a wise man would never run such an unequal risk a man cannot answer it to common arguments the law of numbers and the rules of proportion are against him no gamester will set at such a main no man will lay such a wager where he may lose but cannot win there is another unhappy misfortune in the mistake too that it can never be discovered till tis too late to remedy he that resolves to die an atheist shuts the door against being convinced in time if it should so fall out as who can tell but that there is a god a heaven and hell mankind had best consider well for fear it should be too late when his mistakes appear i should not pretend to set up for an instructor in this case were not the inference so exceeding just who can but preach where there is such a text when god himself speaks his own power he expects we should draw just inferences from it both for ourselves and our friends if one man in an hundred years shall arrive at a conviction of the being of his maker tis very well worth my while to write it and to bear the character of an impertinent fellow from all the rest i thought to make some apology for the meanness of style and the method which may be a little unusual of printing letters from the countryside in their own style for the last i only leave this short reason with the reader the desire i had to keep close to the truth and hand my relation with the true authorities from whence i received it together with some justice to the gentlemen concerned who especially in cases of deliverances are willing to record the testimonial of the mercies they received and to set their hands to the humble acknowledgment the plainness and honesty of the story will plead for the meanness of the style in many of the letters and the reader cannot want eyes to see what sort of people some of them come from others speak for themselves and being writ by men of letters as well as men of principles i have not arrogance enough to attempt a correction either of the sense or style and if i had gone about it should have injured both author and reader these come dressed in their own words because i ought not and those because i could not mend them i am persuaded they are all dressed in the desirable though unfashionable garb of truth and i doubt not but posterity will read them with pleasure the gentlemen who have taken pains to collect and transmit the particular relations here made public i hope will have their end answered in this essay conveying hereby to the ages to come the memory of the dreadfulest and most universal judgment that ever almighty power thought fit to bring upon this part of the world and as this was the true native and original design of the first undertaking abstracted from any part of the printer's advantage the editor and undertakers of this work having their ends entirely answered hereby 
give their humble thanks to all those gentlemen who have so far approved the sincerity of their design as to contribute their trouble and help forward by their just observations the otherwise very difficult undertaking if posterity will but make the desired improvement both of the collector's pains as well as the several gentlemen's care in furnishing the particulars i dare say that they will all acknowledge their end fully answered and none more readily than the age's humble servant end of the preface to the storm chapter 1 of the storm this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the storm by daniel defoe chapter 1 of the natural causes and original of winds though a system of exhalation dilation and extension things which the ancients founded the doctrine of winds upon be not my direct business yet it cannot but be needful to the present design to note that the difference in the opinions of the ancients about the nature and original of winds is a leading step to one assertion which I have advanced in all that I have said with relation to winds, viz., that there seems to be more of God in the whole appearance than in any other part of operating nature. Nor do I think I need explain myself very far in this notion. I allow the high original of nature to be the great author of all her actings, and by the strict reign of his providence is the continual and exact guide of her executive power but still tis plain that in some of the principal parts of nature she is naked to our eye things appear both in their causes and consequences demonstration gives its assistance and finishes our further inquiries for we never inquire about God in those works of nature which, depending upon the course of things, are plain and demonstrative, but where we find nature defective in her discovery, where we see effects but cannot reach their causes, there tis most just, and nature herself seems to direct us to it, to end the rational inquiry, and resolve it into speculation. Nature plainly refers us beyond herself to the mighty hand of infinite power, the author of nature, and original of all causes. Among these arcana of the sovereign economy, the winds are laid as far back as any. Those ancient men of genius who rifled nature by the torchlight of reason even to her very nudities have been run aground in this unknown channel the wind has blown out the candle of reason and left them all in the dark aristotle in his problems section twenty two calls the wind eris impulsum seneca says ventus est Air fluens the stoics held it motem at fluxionem eteris mr hobbes air moved in a direct or undulating motion fournier le vent est un mouvement agitation de l'air calci par des exhalations et vapor the moderns a hot and dry exhalation 
repulsed by anti-peristasis. Descartes defines it venti nil sunt nisi moti, e delati vapores, and various other opinions are very judiciously collected by the learned Mr. Bohun in his Treatise on the Origin and Properties of Wind, page 7, and concludes that no one hypothesis, how comprehensive soever, has yet been able to resolve all the incident phenomena of winds. Bohun of Winds, page 9. This is what I quote them for, and this is all my argument demands. The deepest search into the region of cause and consequence has found out just enough to leave the wisest philosopher in the dark, to bewilder his head, and drown his understanding. You raise a storm in nature by the very inquiry, and, at last, to be rid of you, she confesses the truth, and tells you, It is not in me. You must go home and ask my father. Whether then it be the motion of air, and what that air is, which is as yet undefined, whether it is a dilation, a previous contraction, and then violent extension, as in gunpowder, whether the motion is direct, circular, or oblique, whether it be an exhalation repulsed by the middle region, and the antiperistasis of that part of the heavens, which is set as a wall of brass to bind up the atmosphere, and keep it within its proper compass for the functions of respiration, condensing, and rarefying, without which nature would be all in confusion. Whatever are their efficient causes, tis not much to the immediate design. Tis apparent that God Almighty, whom the philosophers care as little as possible to have anything to do with, seems to have reserved this as one of those secrets in nature which should more directly guide them to himself. Not but that a philosopher may be a Christian, and some of the best of the latter have been the best of the former, as Vosius, Mr. Boyle, Sir Walter Raleigh, Lord Verulam, Dr. Harvey, and others. I wish I could say Mr. Hobbes, for twas pity there would lie any just exceptions to the piety of a man who had so few to his general knowledge and an exalted spirit in philosophy. When, therefore, I say the philosophers do not care to concern God himself in the search after natural knowledge, I mean, as it concerns natural knowledge, merely as such. For tis a natural cause they seek, from a general maxim, that all nature has its cause within itself, Tis true, tis the darkest part of the search to trace the chain backward, to begin at the consequence, and from thence hunt counter, as we may call it, to find out the cause. T'would be much easier if we could begin at the cause, and trace it to all its consequences. I make no question, the search would be equally to the advantage of science, and the improvement of the world. For without doubt, there are some consequences of known causes which are not yet discovered, and I am as ready to believe that there are yet in nature some terra incognita, both as to cause and consequence, too. In this search after causes, the philosopher, though he may at the same time be a very good Christian, cares not at all to meddle with his maker. The reason is plain. We may at any time resolve all things into infinite power, and we do allow that the finger of infinite is the first mighty cause of nature herself. 
but the treasury of immediate cause is generally committed to nature and if at any time we are driven to look beyond her tis because we are out of the way tis not because it is not in her but because we cannot find it two men met in the middle of a great wood one was searching for a plant which grew in the wood the other had lost himself in the wood and wanted to get out the latter rejoiced when through the trees he saw the open country but the other man's business was not to get out but to find what he looked for yet this man no more undervalued the pleasantness of the champion country than the other thus in nature the philosopher's business is not to look through nature and come to the vast open field of infinite power his business is in the wood there grows the plant he looks for and tis there he must find it philosophy's a ground if it is forced to any further inquiry the christian begins just where the philosopher ends and when the inquirer turns his eyes up to heaven farewell philosopher tis a sign he can make nothing of it here david was a good man the scripture gives him that testimony but i am of the opinion he was a better king than a scholar more a saint than a philosopher and it seems very proper to judge that david was upon the search of natural causes and found himself puzzled as to the inquiry when he finishes the inquiry with two pious ejaculations when i view the heavens the works of thy hands the moon and the stars which thou hast made then i say what is man david may very rationally be supposed to be searching the causes motions and influences of heavenly bodies and finding his philosophy a ground and the discovery not to answer his search he turns it all to pious use recognizes infinite power and applies it to the ecstasies and raptures of his soul which were always employed in the charm of exalted praise thus in another place we find him dissecting the womb of his mother and deep in the study of anatomy but having as it may be well supposed no help from johann remelini or of the learned riolanus and other anatomists famous for the most exquisite discovery of human body and all the vessels of life with their proper dimensions and use all david could say to the matter was good man to look up to heaven and admire what he could not understand psalm i was fearfully and wonderfully made etc this is very good and well becomes a pulpit but what's all this to a philosopher tis not enough for him to know that god has made the heavens the moon and the stars but must inform himself where he has placed them and why there and what their business what their influences their functions and the end of their being tis not enough for an anatomist to know that he is fearfully and wonderfully made in the lowermost part of the earth but he must see those lowermost parts search into the method nature proceeds upon in the performing the office appointed must search the steps she takes the tools she works by and in short know all that the god of nature has permitted to be capable of demonstration and it seems a just authority for our search that some things are so placed in nature by a chain of causes and effects that upon a diligent search we may find out what we look for to search after what god has in his sovereignty thought fit to conceal 
may be criminal, and doubtless is so, and the fruitlessness of the inquiry is generally part of the punishment to a vain curiosity. But to search after what our Maker has not hid, only covered with a thin veil of natural obscurity, and which upon our search is plain to be read, seems to be justified by the very nature of the thing, and the possibility of the demonstration is an argument to prove the lawfulness of the inquiry. The design of this digression is, in short, that as where nature is plain to be searched into, and demonstration easy, the philosopher is allowed to seek for it. So where God has, as it were, laid his hand upon any place, and nature presents us with an universal blank, we are therein led as naturally to recognize the infinite wisdom and power of the God of nature, as David was in the texts before quoted. And this is the case here. The winds are some of those inscrutables of nature in which humane search has not yet been able to arrive at any demonstration. The winds, says the learned Mr. Bowen, are generated in the intermediate space between earth and the clouds, either by rarefaction or repletion, and sometimes haply by the pressure of clouds, elastical virtue of the air, etc., from the earth or seas, by submarine or subterranean eruption, or dissension or resolution from the middle region. All this, though no man is more capable of the inquiry than this gentleman, yet to the demonstration of the thing amounts to no more than what we had before, and still leaves it as abstruse and cloudy to our understanding as ever. Not but that I think myself bound in duty to science in general, to pay a just debt to the excellency of philosophical study, in which I am a mere junior, and hardly more than an admirer, and therefore I cannot but allow that the demonstrations made of rarefaction and dilatation are extraordinary, and that by fire and water wind may be raised in a closed room as the Lord Ferulam made experiment in the case of his feathers, but that, therefore, all the causes of wind are from the influences of the sun upon vaporous matter first exhaled, which, being dilated, are obliged to possess themselves of more space than before, and, consequently, make the particles fly before them. This does not seem to be a sufficient demonstration of wind. For this, to my weak apprehension, would rather make a blow like gunpowder than a rushing forward. At best, this is indeed a probable conjecture, but admits not of demonstration equal to other phenomena in nature. And this is all I am upon, viz., that this case has not equal proofs of the natural causes of it that we meet with in other cases. The scripture seems to confirm this when it says in one place, He holds the wind in his hand, as if he should mean other things are left to the common discoveries of natural inquiry, but this is a thing he holds in his own hand and has concealed it from the search of the most diligent and piercing understanding. This is further confirmed by the words of our Saviour, The wind blows where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but knowest not whence it cometh. Tis plainly expressed to signify that the causes of the wind are not equally discovered by natural inquiry, as the rest of nature is. 
if I would carry this matter on, and travel into the seas and mountains of America, where the mansonets, the trade winds, the sea breezes, and such winds as we have little knowledge of, are more common, it would yet more plainly appear that we hear the sound, but know not from whence they come nor is the cause of their motion parallel to the surface of the earth, a less mystery than their original, or the difficulty of their generation. And though some people have been forward to prove the gravity of the particles must cause the motion to be oblique, tis plain it must be very little so, or else navigation would be impracticable, and in extraordinary cases, where the pressure above is perpendicular, it has been fatal to ships, houses, etc., and would have terrible effects in the world, if it should more frequently be so. From this I draw only this conclusion, that the winds are a part of the works of God by nature, in which he has been pleased to communicate less of demonstration to us than in other cases, that the particulars more directly lead us to speculations, and refer us to infinite power more than the other parts of nature does. That the wind is more expressive and adapted to his immediate power as he is pleased to exert it in extraordinary cases in the world. That is more frequently made use of as the executioner of his judgments in the world, and extraordinary events are brought to pass by it. From these three heads we are brought down directly to speak of the particular storm before us, viz. the greatest the longest in duration, the widest in extent, of all the tempests and storms that history gives any account of since the beginning of time. In the further conduct of the story, twill not be foreign to the purpose nor unprofitable to the reader to review the histories of ancient time and remote countries and examine in what manner God has been pleased to execute his judgments by storms and tempests, what kind of things they have been, and what the consequences of them, and then bring down the parallel to the dreadful instance before us. We read in the scripture of two great storms, one past and the other to come. Whether the last be not allegorical rather than prophetical, I shall not busy myself to determine. The first was when God caused a strong wind to blow upon the face of the deluged world, to put a stop to the flood, and reduce the waters to their proper channel. I wish our naturalists would explain that wind to us, and tell us, which way it blew, or how it is possible that any direct wind could cause the waters to ebb. For to me it seems that the deluge being universal, that wind which blew the waters from one part must blow them up in another. Whether it was not some perpendicular gusts that might by their force separate the water and the earth, and cause the water driven from off the land to subside by its own pressure. I shall dive no farther into that mysterious deluge, which has some things in it which recommend the story, rather to our faith than demonstration. The other storm I find in the scripture is in the God shall rain upon the wicked, plagues, fire, and a horrible tempest. What this shall be we wait to know, and happy are they who shall be secured from its effects. Histories are full of instances of violent tempests and storms in sundry particular places, 
what that was which mingled with such violent lightnings set the cities of sodom and gomorrah on fire remains to me yet undecided nor am i satisfied the effect it had on the waters of the lake which are to this day called the dead sea are such as some fabulous authors have related and as travellers take it upon them to say end of chapter 1 of the storm Chapter Two of The Storm. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Storm by Daniel Defoe. Chapter Two of the Opinion of the Ancients that this island was more subject to storm than other parts of the world i am not of opinion with the early ages of the world when these islands were first known that they were the most terrible of any part of the world for storms and tempests camden tells us the britons were distinguished from all the world by unpassable seas and terrible northern winds which made the albion shores dreadful to sailors and this part of the world was therefore reckoned the utmost bounds of the northern known land, beyond which none had ever sailed, and quotes a great variety of ancient authors to this purpose, some of which I present as a specimen. Et benitus toto divisus orbe Britannus, Britons disjoined from all the well-known world, Cam litus adjusta, Horeshit Libye ratibus impervia tule, taken frequently for Britain, ignotum fretum, Claudius. And if the notions the world then had were true, it would be very absurd for us who live here to pretend miracles in any extremes of tempests since by what the poets of those ages flourished about stormy weather was the native and most proper epithet of the place belluosas qui remotis obstrepit oceanus britannus horace nay some are for placing the nativity of the winds hereabouts as if they had been all generated here and the confluence of matter had made this island its general rendezvous. But I shall easily show that there are several places in the world far better adapted to be the general receptacle or centre of vapours, to supply a fund of tempestuous matter than England, as particularly the vast lakes of North America, of which afterwards and yet i have two notions one real one imaginary of the reasons which gave the ancients such terrible apprehensions of this part of the world which of late we find as habitable and navigable as any of the rest the real occasion i suppose thus that before the multitude and industry of habitants prevailed to the managing enclosing and improving the country the vast tract of land in this island, which continually lay open to the flux of the sea and to the inundations of land waters, were as so many lakes, from whence the sun continually exhaling vast quantities of moist vapours, the air could not but be continually crowded with all those parts of necessary matter to which we ascribe the original of winds, rains, storms, and the like. He that is acquainted with the situation of England, and can reflect on the vast quantities of flat grounds, 
on the banks of all of our navigable rivers and the shores of the sea which lands at least lying under water every springtide and being thereby continually full of moisture were like a stagnated standing body of water brooding vapours in the interval of the tide must own that at least a fifteenth part of the whole island may come into this denomination let him that doubts the truth of this examine a little the particulars let him stand upon shooter's hill in kent and view the mouth of the river thames and consider what a river it must be when none of the marshes on either side were walled in from the sea and when the sea without all question flowed up to the foot of the hills on either shore and up every creek which he must allow now is now dry land on either side the river for two miles in breadth at least and sometimes three or four for above forty miles on both sides of the river let him farther reflect how all these parts lay when as our ancient histories relate the danish fleet came up almost to hartford so that all that range of fresh marches which reach for twenty-five miles in length from where to the river thames must be a sea in short let any such considering person imagine the vast tract of marshlands on both sides the river thames to harwich on the essex side and to whitstable on the kentish side the levels of marshes up from the stour from sandwich to canterbury the whole extent of the low grounds commonly called rumney marsh from hythe to winchelsea and up the banks of the rother all which put together and being allowed to be in one place covered with water what a lake would it be supposed to make according to the nicest calculations i can make it could not amount to less than five hundred thousand acres of land the isle of ely with the flats up the several rivers from yarmouth to norwich beckleys and the continued levels in the several counties of norfolk cambridge suffolk huntington northampton and lincoln i believe do really contain as much land as the whole county of norfolk and tis not many ages since these counties were universally one vast morass or lock and the few solid parts wholly unapproachable inasmuch that the town of ely itself was a receptacle for the malcontents of the nation where no reasonable force could come near to dislodge them tis needless to reckon up twelve or fourteen like places in england as the moors in somersetshire the flat shores in lancashire yorkshire and durham the like in hampshire and sussex and in short on the banks of every navigable river the sum of the matter is this that while this nation was thus full of standing lakes stagnated waters and moist places the multitude of exhalations must furnish the air with a quantity of matter for showers and storms infinitely more than it can be now supplied with all those tracts of land being now fenced off laid dry and turned into wholesome and profitable provinces this seems demonstrated from ireland where the multitude of lochs lakes bogs and moist places serve the air with exhalations which give themselves back again in showers and might be called the piss-pot of the world the imaginary notion i have to advance on this head amounts only to a reflection upon the skill of those ages in the art of navigation which being far short of what it is since arrived to made these vast northern seas 
too terrible for them to venture in, and, accordingly, they raised those apprehensions up to fable, which began only in their want of judgment. The Phoenicians, who were our first navigators, the Genoese, and after them the Portuguese, who arrived to extraordinary proficiency in sea affairs, were yet all of them, as we say, fair-weather seamen. The chief of their navigation was coasting, and, if they were driven out of their knowledge, had work enough to find their way home, and sometimes never found it at all. But one sea conveyed them directly into the last ocean, from whence no navigation could return them. When these, by adventures, or misadventures rather, had at any time extended their voyaging as far as this island, which, by the way, they always performed round the coast of Spain, Portugal, and France. If ever such a vessel returned, if ever the bold navigator arrived at home, he had done enough to talk on all his days, and needed no other diversion among the neighbours than to give an account of the vast seas, mighty rocks, deep gulfs, and prodigious storms he met within these remote parts of the known world, and this magnified by the poetical arts of the learned men of those times, grew into a received maxim of navigation, that these parts were so full of constant tempests, storms, and dangerous seas, that twas present death to come near them, and none but madmen and desperados could have any business there, since they were places where ships never came, and navigation was not proper in the place. And Thule, where no passage was, for ships their sails to bear. Horace has reference to this horrid part of the world as a place full of terrible monsters, and fit only for their habitation, in the words before quoted. Beluosus qui remotus, obstrepit Oceanus Britannus. Juvenal follows his steps. Quanto delfino balena Britannica major. Such horrible apprehensions those ages had of these parts, which, by our experience, and the prodigy to which navigation in particular, and sciential knowledge in general, is since grown, appear very ridiculous. For we find no danger in our shores, no uncertain wavering in our tides, no frightful gulfs, no horrid monsters, but what the bold mariner has made familiar to him. The gulfs which frightened those early sons of Neptune are searched out by our seamen, and made useful bays, roads, and harbours of safety. The promontories which, running out into the sea, gave them terrible apprehensions of danger, are our safety, and make the sailors' hearts glad, as they are the first lands they make when they are coming home from a long voyage, or as they are a good shelter when in a storm our ships get under their lee. Our shores are sounded, the sands and flats are discovered, which they knew little or nothing of, in which more real danger lies than in all the frightful stories they told us. Useful sea marks and land figures are placed on the shore, buoys on the water, lighthouses on the highest rocks, and all these dreadful parts of the world are become the seat of trade and the center of navigation. Art has reconciled all the difficulties 
and use made all the horribles and terribles of those ages become as natural and familiar as daylight the hidden sands almost the only real dread of a sailor and by which till the channels between them were found out our eastern coast must be really unpassable now served to make harbours and yarmouth road was made a safe place for shipping by them nay when portsmouth plymouth and other good harbours would not defend our ships in the violent tempest we are treating of here was the least damage done of any place in england considering the number of ships which lay at anchor and the openness of the place so that upon the whole it seems plain to me that all the dismal things the ancients told us of britain and her terrible shores arose from the infancy of marine knowledge and the weakness of the sailor's courage not but that i readily allow we are more subject to bad weather and hard gales of wind than the coasts of spain italy and barbary but if this be allowed our improvement in the art of building ships is so considerable our vessels are so prepared to ride out the most violent storms that the fury of the sea is the least thing our sailors fear keep them but from a lee shore or touching upon a sand they'll venture all the rest and nothing is a greater satisfaction to them if they have a storm in view than a sound bottom and good sea-room from hence it comes to pass that such winds as in those days would have passed for storms are called only a fresh gale or blowing hard if it blows enough to fright a south country sailor we laugh at it and if our sailors bald terms were set down in a table of degrees it will explain what we mean stark calm a top sail gale calm weather blows fresh little wind a hard gale of wind a fine breeze a fret of wind a small gale a storm a fresh gale a tempest just half these tarpaulin articles i presume would have passed in those days for a storm and that our sailors call a top sail gale would have drove the navigators of those ages into harbors when our sailors reef a topsail they would have handled all their sails and when we go under a main course they would have run afore it for life to the next port they could make when our hard gale blows they would have cried a tempest and about the fret of wind they would be all at their prayers and if we should reckon by this account we are a stormy country indeed our seas are no more navigable now for such sailors than they were then if the japanese the east indians and such like navigators were to come with their thin cockle-shell barks and calico sails if cleopatra's fleet or caesar's great ships with which he fought the battle of actium were to come upon our seas there hardly comes a march or a september in twenty years but would blow them to pieces and then the poor remnant that got home would go and talk of a terrible country where there's nothing but storms and tempests where all the matter is the weakness of their shipping and the ignorance of their seamen and i make no question 
but our ships ride out many a worse storm than that terrible tempest which scattered Julius Caesar's fleet, or the same that drove Aeneas on the coast of Carthage. And in more modern times we have a famous instance in the Spanish Armada, which, after it was rather frighted than damaged by Sir Francis Drake's machines, not then known by the name of fire-ships, were scattered by a terrible storm, and lost upon every shore. The case is plain. T'was all owing to the accident of navigation. They had no doubt a hard gale of wind, and perhaps a storm. But they were also on an enemy's coast, their pilots out of their knowledge, no harbour to run into, and an enemy astern, that when once they separated, fear drove them from one danger to another, and away they went to the northward, where they had nothing but God's mercy, and the winds and seas to help them. In all these storms and distresses which ruined that fleet, we do not find an account of the loss of one ship, either of the English or Dutch, the Queen's fleet rode it out in the Downs, which all men know is none of the best roads in the world, and the Dutch rode among the flats of the Flemish coasts, while the vast galleons, not so well fitted for the weather, were forced to keep the sea, and were driven to and fro, till they got out of their knowledge, and, like men desperate, embraced every danger that came near. This long digression I could not but think needful, in order to clear up the case, having never met with anything on this head before. At the same time tis allowed, and histories are full of the particulars, that we have often very high winds, and sometimes violent tempests in these northern parts of the world, but I am still of opinion such a tempest never happened before as that which is the subject of these sheets, and I refer the reader to the particulars. End of chapter 2 of The Storm Chapter 3 of The Storm by Daniel Defoe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the Storm in General. Before we come to examine the damage suffered by this terrible night and give a particular relation of its dismal effects, tis necessary to give a summary account of the thing itself with all its affrightening circumstances. It had blown exceeding hard, as I have already observed, for about fourteen days past, and that so hard that we thought it terrible weather. Several stacks of chimneys were blown down, and several ships were lost, and the tiles in many places were blown off from the houses, and the nearer it came to the fatal 26th of November, the tempestuousness of the weather increased. On the Wednesday morning before, being the 24th of November, it was fair weather and blew hard, but not so as to give any apprehensions, till about four o'clock in the afternoon the wind increased and with squalls of rain and terrible gusts, blew very furiously. The collector of these sheets narrowly escaped the mischief of a part of a house which fell on the evening of that day by the violence of the wind. 
and abundance of tiles were blown off the houses that night. The wind continued with unusual violence all the next day and night, and had not the great storm followed so soon, this had passed for a great wind. On Friday morning it continued to blow exceeding hard, but not so as that it gave any apprehensions of danger within doors. Towards night it increased, and about ten o'clock our barometers informed us that the night would be very tempestuous. The mercury sunk lower than ever I had observed it on any occasion whatsoever which made me suppose the tube had been handled and disturbed by the children. But as my observations of this nature are not regular enough to supply the reader with a full information, the disorders of that dreadful night, having found me other employment, expecting every moment when the house I was in would bury us all in its own ruins, I have therefore subjoined a letter from an ingenious gentleman on this very head, directed to the Royal Society, and printed in the Philosophical Transactions, number 289, page 1530, as follows. A letter from the Reverend Mr. William Durham, F.R.S., containing his observations concerning the late storm. Sir, according to my promise at the general meeting of the R.S. on St. Andrew's Day, I here send you enclosed the account of my ingenious and inquisitive friend Richard Townley, Esquire, concerning the state of the atmosphere in that part of Lancashire, where he liveth in the late dismal storm, and I hope it will not be unacceptable to accompany his with my own observations at Upminster, especially since I shall not weary you with the long history of the devastations, etc., but rather some particulars of a more philosophical consideration. And first, I do not think it improper to look back to the preceding seasons of the year, I scarce believe I shall go out of the way to reflect as far back as April, May, June, and July, because all these were wet months in our southern parts. In April there fell 12.49 liters of rain through my tunnel, and about 6, 7, 8, or 9 liters, I esteem a moderate quantity for Upminster. In May there fell more than in any month of any year since the year 1696, viz. 20.77 liters. June, likewise, was a dripping month, in which fell 14.55 liters, and July, although it had considerable intermissions, yet had 14.19 litres, above 11 litres of which fell on July 28th and 29th in violent showers. And I remember the newspapers gave accounts of great rains that month from diverse places of Europe, but the north of England, which also escaped the violence of the late storm, was not so remarkably wet in any of those months, at least not in that great proportion more than we, as usually they are, as I guess from the tables of rain with which Mr. Townley hath favoured me. Particularly, July was a dry month with them, there being no more than 3.65 litres of rain fell through Mr. Townley's tunnel, of the same diameter with mine. From these months let us pass to September, and that we shall find to have been a wet month, especially the latter part of it. There fell of rain in that month 
14.86 litres. October and November last, although not remarkably wet, yet have been open warm months for the most part. My thermometer, whose freezing point is about 84, hath been very seldom below a hundred all this winter, and especially in November. Thus I have laid before you as short account as I could of the preceding disposition of the year, particularly as to wet and warmth, because I am of opinion that these had a great influence in the late storm, not only in causing a repletion of vapours in the atmosphere, but also in raising such nitrosulfurous or other heterogeneous matter, which then mixed together might make a sort of explosion, like fired gunpowder in the atmosphere. And from this explosion I judge these coruscations, or flashes in the storm, to have proceeded, which most people as well as myself observed, and which some took for lightning. But these things I leave to better judgments, such as that very ingenious member of our society who hath undertaken the province of the late tempest, to whom, if you please, you may impart these papers. Mr. Hawley, you know I mean. From preliminaries it is time to proceed nearer to the tempest itself, and the foregoing day, viz. Thursday, November 25th, I think deserveth regard. In the morning of that day was a little rain, the winds high in the afternoon, south by east and south. In the evening there was lightning, and between nine and ten of the clock at night a violent but short storm of wind, and much rain at Upminster, and of hail in some other places, which did some damage. There fell in that storm 1.65 litres of rain. The next morning, which was Friday, November 26th, the wind was south-southwest, and high all day, and so it continued till I was in bed and asleep. About twelve that night the storm awakened me, which gradually increased till near three that morning, and from thence till near seven it continued in the greatest excess, and then began slowly to abate, and the mercury to rise swiftly. The barometer I found at 12.30 p.m. at 28.72, where it continued till about 6 the next morning, or 6.15, and then hastily rose so that it was gotten to 82 about 8 of the clock, as in the table. How the wind sat during the late storm, I cannot positively say, it being excessively dark all the while, and my vein blown down also, when I could have seen. But by information from millers and others that were forced to venture abroad, and by my own guess, I imagine it to have blown about southwest by south, or nearer to the south in the beginning, and to veer about towards the west, towards the end of the storm, as far as west-southwest. The degrees of the wind's strength being not measurable, that I know of, though talked of, but by guess I thus determine with respect to other storms. On February 7th, 1698 or 9, was a terrible storm that did much damage. This I number ten degrees. The wind then west-northwest, vid PHTR number 262. Another remarkable storm was February 3rd, 1701 or 2, at which time was the greatest descent of the mercury 
ever known. This I number nine degrees, but this last of November I number at least fifteen degrees. As to the stations of the barometer, you have Mr. Townley's and mine in the following table to be seen at one view. A table showing the height of the mercury in the barometer at Townley and Upminster before, in, and after the storm. Townley Day, November 25th Hour, 7 Height of Mercury, 28, 98 Hour, 3 Height of Mercury, 64 Hour, 9 and a half Height of Mercury, 61 Upminster Day, November 25th Hour, 8 Height of Mercury, 29.50 Hour 12, Height of Mercury, 39 Hour 9, Height of Mercury, 14 Townley, November 26th Hour 7, Height of Mercury, 80 Hour 3, Height of Mercury, 79 Hour nine and one eighth, forty seven. Upminster, November twenty sixth. Hour eight, height of Mercury, thirty three. Hour twelve, height of Mercury, twenty eight. Ten. Hour twelve and a half, height of Mercury, twenty eight, seventy two. Townley, November twenty seventh. Hour 7, height of Mercury, 50. Hour 3, height of Mercury, 81. Hour 9 and a half, height of Mercury, 95. Upminster, November 27th. Hour 7 and a half, height of Mercury, 82. Hour 12, height of Mercury, 29, 31. Hour 9, height of Mercury, 42. Townley, November 28th. Hour 7, height of Mercury, 29, 34. Hour 3, height of Mercury, 62. Hour 9, height of Mercury, 84. Upminster, November 28th. Hour 8, height of Mercury, 65. Hour 12, height of Mercury, 83. Hour 9, height of Mercury, 30. 7. Townley, November 29th. Hour 7, height of Mercury, 88. Upminster, Upminster, hour 8, height of Mercury, 25. As to November 17th, whereon Mr. Townley mentions a violent storm in Oxfordshire, it was a stormy afternoon here at Upminster, accompanied with rain, but not violent, nor mercury very low. November 11th and 12th had both higher winds and more rain, and the mercury was those days lower than even in the last storm of November 26th. Thus, sir, I have given you the truest account I can of what I thought most to deserve observation, both before and in the late storm. I could have added some other particulars, but that I fear I have already made my letter long and am tedious. I shall therefore only add that I have accounts of the violence of the storm at Norwich, Beckley's, Sudbury, Colchester, Rockford, and several other intermediate places. But I need not tell particulars, because I question not, but you have better informations. Thus far, Mr. Durham's letter.
It did not blow so hard till twelve o'clock at night, but that most families went to bed, though many of them not without some concern at the terrible wind, which then blew. But about one, or at least by two o'clock, tis supposed, a few people that were capable of any sense of danger were so hardy as to lie in bed, and the fury of the tempest increased to such a degree that, as the editor of this account being in London, and conversing with the people the next days, understood most people expected the fall of their houses. And yet in this general apprehension, nobody durst quit their tottering habitations, for whatever the danger was within doors, twas worse without. The bricks, tiles, and stones from the tops of the houses flew with such force and so thick in the streets that no one thought fit to venture out, though their houses were near demolished within. The author of this relation was in a well-built brick house in the skirts of the city, and a stack of chimneys falling in upon the next houses gave the house such a shock that they thought it was just coming down upon their heads, but opening the door to attempt an escape into a garden, the danger was so apparent that all thought fit to surrender to the disposal of almighty providence, and expect their graves in the ruins of the house, rather than to meet most certain destruction in the open garden. For unless they could have gone above two hundred yards from any building, there had been no security, for the force of the wind blew the tiles point-blank, though their weight inclines them downward, and in several very broad streets we saw the windows broken by the flying of tile sherds from the other side, and where there was room for them to fly, the author of this has seen tiles blown from a house above thirty or forty yards, and stuck from five to eight inches into the solid earth. Pieces of timber, iron, and sheets of lead have from higher buildings been blown much farther, as in the particulars hereafter will appear. It is the received opinion of abundance of people that they felt, during the impetuous fury of the wind, several movements of the earth, and we have several letters which affirm it. But as an earthquake must have been so general that everybody must have discerned it, and as the people were in their houses when they imagined they felt it, the shaking and terror of which might deceive their imagination and impose upon their judgment. I shall not venture to affirm it was so, and being resolved to use so much caution in this relation as to transmit nothing to posterity without authentic vouchers, and such testimony as no reasonable man will dispute. So, if any relation come in our way, which may afford us a probability, though it may be related for the sake of its strangeness or novelty, it shall nevertheless come in the company of all its uncertainties, and the reader left to judge of its truth. For this account had not been undertaken but with design to undeceive the world of false relations, and to give an account backed with such authorities as that the credit of it should admit of no disputes. For this reason, I cannot venture to affirm that there was any such thing as an earthquake, but the concern and consternation of all people was so great 
that I cannot wonder at their imagining several things which were not, any more than their enlarging on things that were, since nothing is more frequent than for fear to double every object and impose upon the understanding strong apprehensions being apt very often to persuade us of the reality of such things which we have no other reasons to show for the probability of than what are grounded in those fears which prevail at that juncture others thought they heard thunder tis confessed the wind by its unusual violence made such a noise in the air as had a resemblance to thunder and twas observed the roaring had a voice as much louder than usual as the fury of the wind was greater than was ever known the noise had also something in it more formidable it sounded aloft and roared not very much unlike remote thunder and yet though i cannot remember to have heard it thunder or that i saw any lightning or heard of any that did in or near london yet in the counties the air was seen full of meteors and vaporous fires and in some places both thunderings and unusual flashes of lightning to the great terror of the inhabitants and yet i cannot but observe here how fearless such people as are addicted to wickedness are both of god's judgments and uncommon prodigies which is visible in this particular that a gang of hardened rogues assaulted a family at poplar in the very height of the storm, broke into the house and robbed them. It is observable that the people cried thieves, and after that cried fire, in hopes to raise the neighborhood and to get some assistance. But such is the power of self-preservation, and such was the fear the minds of the people were possessed with, that nobody would venture out to the assistance of the distressed family who were rifled and plundered in the middle of all the extremity of the tempest it would admit of a large comment here and perhaps not very unprofitable to examine from what sad defects in principle it must be that men can be so destitute of all manner of regard to invisible and superior power to be acting one of the vilest parts of a villain while infinite power was threatening the whole world with desolation and multitudes of people expected the last day was at hand several women in the city of london who were in travail or who fell into travail by the fright of the storm were obliged to run the risk of being delivered with such help as they had and midwives found their own lives in such danger that few of them thought themselves obliged to show any concern for the lives of others fire was the only mischief that did not happen to make the night completely dreadful and yet that was not so everywhere for in Norfolk, the town of Blank was almost ruined by a furious fire, which burnt with such vehemence, and was so fanned by the tempest, that the inhabitants had no power to concern themselves in the extinguishing it. The wind blew the flames, together with the ruins, so about that there was no standing near it, for if the people came to windward they were in danger to be blown into the flames and if to leeward the flames were so blown up in their faces they could not bear to come near it if this disaster had happened in london it must have been very
fatal. For as no regular application could have been made for the extinguishing it, so the very people in danger would have had no opportunity to have saved their goods, and hardly their lives. For though a man will run any risk to avoid being burnt, yet it must have been next to a miracle if any person so obliged to escape from the flames had escaped being knocked on the head in the streets, for the bricks and tiles flew about like small shot, and t'was a miserable sight in the morning after the storm to see the streets covered with tile sherds and heaps of rubbish from the tops of the houses lying almost at every door. From two of the clock the storm continued, and increased till five in the morning, and from five to half an hour after six it blew with the greatest violence. The fury of it was so exceeding great for that particular hour and a half, that if it had not abated as it did, nothing could have stood its violence much longer. In this last part of the time, the greatest part of the damage was done. Several ships that rode it out till now gave up all, for no anchor could hold. Even the ships in the river of Thames were all blown away from their moorings, and from Execution Dock to Limehouse Hole, there was but our ships that rid it out. The rest were driven down into the bite, as the sailors call it, from Bell Wharf to Limehouse, where they were huddled together and drove on shore, heads and sterns, one upon the other, in such a manner as any one would have thought it had been impossible, and the damage done on that account was incredible. Together with the violence of the wind, the darkness of the night added to the terror of it, and as it was just new moon, the spring tides being then up at about four o'clock, made the vessels which were afloat in the river drive the farther up upon the shore, of all which in the process of this story we shall find very strange instances. The points from whence the wind blew are variously reported from various hands. Tis certain it blew all the day before at southwest, and I thought it continued so till about two o'clock, when, as near as I could judge by the impressions it made on the house, for we durst not look out, it veered to the south-southwest, then to the west and about six o'clock to west by north, and still more northward. It shifted, the harder it blew, till it shifted again southerly about seven o'clock, and as it did so, it gradually abated. About eight o'clock in the morning it ceased so much that our fears were also abated, and people began to peep out of doors, but tis impossible to express the concern that appeared in every place. The distraction and fury of the night was visible in the faces of the people, and everybody's first work was to visit and inquire after friends and relations. The next day or two was almost entirely spent in the curiosity of the people, in viewing the havoc the storm had made, which was so universal in London, and especially in the out parts, that nothing can be said sufficient to describe it. Another unhappy circumstance with which this disaster was joined was a prodigious tide, which happened the next day but one, and was occasioned by the fury of the winds, which is also a demonstration that the winds veered for part of the time to the northward, and, as it is observable, 
and known by all that understand our sea affairs, that a north-west wind makes the highest tide. So this blowing to the northward, and that with such unusual violence, brought up the sea raging in such a manner that in some parts of England t'was incredible, the water rising six or eight foot higher than it was ever known to do in the memory of man, by which ships were fleeted up upon the firm land, several rods off from the banks, and an incredible number of cattle and people drowned, as in the pursuit of this story will appear. It was a special providence that so directed the waters that in the river of Thames the tide, though it rise higher than usual, yet it did not so prodigiously exceed, but the height of them as it was proved very prejudicial to abundance of people whose cellars and warehouses were near the river, and had the water risen a foot higher, all the marshes and levels on both sides the river had been overflowed, and a great part of the cattle drowned. Though the storm abated with the rising of the sun, it still blew exceeding hard, so hard that no boats durst stir out on the river, but on extraordinary occasions, and about three o'clock in the afternoon, the next day being Saturday, it increased again, and we were in a fresh consternation, lest it should return with the same violence. At four it blew an extreme storm, with sudden gusts as violent as any time of the night, but as it came with a great black cloud and some thunder, it brought a hasty shower of rain, which allayed the storm, so that in a quarter of an hour it went off, and only continued blowing as before. This sort of weather held all Sabbath day and Monday, till on Tuesday afternoon it increased again, and all Tuesday night it blew with such fury that many families were afraid to go to bed, and had not the former terrible night hardened the people to all things less than itself, this night would have passed for a storm fit to have been noted in our almanacs. Several stacks of chimneys that stood out the great storm were blown down in this. Several ships which escaped in the great storm perished this night, and several people who had repaired their houses had them untiled again. Not but that I may allow those chimneys that fell now might have been disabled before. At this rate it held blowing till Wednesday about one o'clock in the afternoon, which was that day seven night on which it began, so that it might be called one continued storm from Wednesday noon to Wednesday noon, in all which time there was not one interval of time in which a sailor would not have acknowledged it blew a storm, and in that time two such terrible nights as I have described, and this I particularly noted as to time, Wednesday, November the 24th, was a calm, fine day, as at that time of year shall be seen. Till above four o'clock, when it began to be cloudy, and the wind rose of a sudden, and in half an hour's time it blew a storm. Wednesday, December the 2nd, it was very tempestuous all the morning. At one o'clock the wind abated, the sky cleared, and by four o'clock there was not a breath of wind. Thus ended the greatest and the longest storm that ever the world saw. The effects of this terrible providence are the subject of the ensuing chapter, 
and I close this with a pastoral poem sent us among the accounts of the storm from a very ingenious author, and desired to be published in this account. A Pastoral Occasioned by the Late Violent Storm Damon Melibius Damon Walking alone by pleasant Isis' side, Where the two streams their wanton course divide, And gently forward in soft murmurs glide, Pensive and sad, I, Melibius, meet, And thus the melancholy shepherd greet. Kind swain, what cloud dares overcast your brow, Bright as the skies, or happy, Nile till now? Does Chloe prove unkind, or some new fair? Melibius, no, Damon, mine's a public nobler care, Such in which you and all the world must share. One friend may mollify another's grief, but public loss admits no relief. Damon, I guess your cause, O oh, you that used to sing of beauty's charms and the delights of spring, now change your note, and let your lute rehearse the dismal tale in melancholy verse. Melibius, prepare then, lovely swain, Prepare to hear the worst report that ever reached your ear. My bower, you know, hard by yon shady grove, A fit recess for Damon's pensive love, As there dissolved I, in sweet slumbers lay, Tired with the toils of the precedent day. The blustering winds disturbed my kind repose, Till, frightened with the threatening blasts, I rose. But, oh, what havoc did the day disclose! Those charming willows which on Cherwell's banks flourished, And thrived, and grew in evener ranks Than those which followed the divine command of Orpheus' lyre, Or sweet Amphion's hand, by hundreds fall while hardly twenty stand. The stately oaks which reach the azure sky, And kiss the very clouds now prostrate lie. Long a huge pine did with the winds contend, This way and that his reeling trunk they bend, Till forced at last to yield, With hideous sound he falls, and all the country feels the wound. Nor was the god of winds content with these. Such humble victims can't his wrath appease. The river swell, not like the happy Nile, To fatten, do, and fructify our isle, But like the deluge, by great Jove designed to drown the universe and scourge mankind in vain the frighted cattle climb so high in vain for refuge to the hills they fly the waters know no limits but the sky so now the bleating flock exchange in vain for barren cliffs their dewy fertile plain in vain their fatal destiny to shun from Severn's banks to higher grounds they run, Nor was the navy better quarter found. There we received our worst, our deepest wound. The billows swell, and haughty Neptune raves. The winds insulting o'er the impetuous waves. Thetis, incensed, rises with angry frown, and once more threatens all the world to drown, And owns no power but England's and her own. 
yet the aeolian god dares vent his rage and even the sovereign of the seas engage what though the mighty charles of spain's on board the winds obey none but their blustering lord some ships were stranded some by the surges rent down with their cargo to the bottom went the absorbent ocean could desire no more so well regaled he never was before the hungry fish could hardly wait the day when the sun's beams should chase the storm away but quickly seize with greedy jaws their prey damon so the great trojan by the hand of fate and haughty power of angry juno's hate while with like aim he crossed the seas was tossed from shore to shore from foreign coast to coast yet safe at last his mighty point he gained in charming promised peace and splendor reigned Melibius. So may great Charles, whom equal glories move, Like the great Darden Prince successful prove, Like him, with honor may he mount the throne, And long enjoy a brighter destined crown. End of chapter 3 of The Storm Chapter Four of the Storm by Daniel Defoe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the extent of this storm, and from what parts it was supposed to come, with some circumstances as to the time of it. As all our histories are full of the relations of tempests and storms, which have happened in various parts of the world, I hope it may not be improper that some of them have been thus observed, with their remarkable effects. But, as I have all along insisted, that no storm since the universal deluge was like this, either in its violence or its duration, so I must also confirm it as to the particular of its prodigious extent. All the storms and tempests we have heard of in the world have been gusts or squalls of wind that have been carried on in their proper channels, and have spent their force in a shorter space. We feel nothing here of the hurricanes of Barbados, the northwests of New England and Virginia, the terrible gusts of the Levant, or the frequent tempests of the North Cape. When Sir Francis Wheeler's squadron perished at Gibraltar, when the city of Strelson was almost ruined by a storm, England felt it not, nor was the air here disturbed with the motion. Even at home, we have had storms of violent wind in one part of England, which have not been felt in another. And if what I have been told has any truth in it, in St. George's Channel there has frequently blown a storm at sea right up and down the channel, which has been felt on neither coast, though it is not above twenty leagues from the English to the Irish shore. Sir William Temple gives us the particulars of two terrible storms in Holland while he was there, in one of which the great cathedral at Utrecht was utterly destroyed, and after that there was a storm so violent in Holland that forty-six vessels were cast away at the Texel, 
and almost all the men drowned. And yet we felt none of these storms here. And for this very reason I have reserved an abridgment of these former cases to this place, which, as they are recited by Sir William Temple, I shall put them down in his own words, being not capable to mend them, and not vain enough to pretend to it. I stayed only a night at Antwerp, which passed with so great thunders and lightnings, that I promised myself a very fair day after it to go back to Rotterdam in the state's yacht that still attended me. The morning proved so, but towards the evening the sky grew foul, and the seamen presaged ill weather, and so resolved to lie at anchor before Bergen op Zoom, the wind being cross and little. When the night was fallen as black as ever I saw, it soon began to clear up, with the most violent flashes of lightning as well as cracks of thunder, that, I believe, have ever been heard in our age and climate. This continued all night, and we felt such a fierce heat from every great flash of lightning that the captain apprehended it would fire his ship. But about eight the next morning the wind changed, and came up with so strong a gale that we came to Rotterdam in about four hours, and there found all mouths full of mischiefs and accidents that the last night's tempest had occasioned, both among the boats and the houses, by the thunder, lightning, hail, or whirlwinds. But the day after came stories to the Hague from all parts, of such violent effects as were almost incredible. At Amsterdam they were deplorable, many trees torn up by the roots, ships sunk in the harbour, and boats in the channels, houses beaten down, and several people were snatched from the ground as they walked the streets, and thrown into the canals. But all was silenced by the relations from Utrecht, where the great and ancient cathedral was torn in pieces by the violence of this storm, and the vast pillars of stone that supported it were wreathed like a twisted club, having been so strongly composed and cemented as rather to suffer such a change of figure than break in pieces, as other parts of the fabric did. Hardly any church in the town escaped the violence of this storm, and very few houses without the marks of it, nor were the effects of it less astonishing by the relations from France and Brussels, where the damages were infinite, as well from whirlwinds, thunder, lightning, as from hailstones of prodigious bigness. This was in the year 1674. In November 1675 happened a storm at northwest, with a spring tide so violent as gave the apprehensions of some loss irrecoverable to the province of Holland, and by several breaches in the great dikes near Enchusen, and others between Amsterdam and Harlem, made way for such inundations as had not been seen before by any man then alive, and filled the country with many relations of most deplorable events. But the incredible diligence and unanimous endeavours of the people upon such occasions gave a stop to the fury of that element, and made way for recovering next year all the lands, though not the people, cattle, and houses that had been lost. Thus far, Sir William Temple. I am also credibly informed that the greatest storm that ever we had in England before, and which was as universal here as this, did no damage in Holland or France 
comparable to this tempest, I mean the great wind in 1661, an abstract of which, as it was printed in Mirabilis Annis, an unknown but unquestioned author, take as follows in his own words. A dreadful storm of wind, accompanied with thunder, lightning, hail, and rain, and together with the sad effects of it in many parts of the nation. Upon the 18th of February, 1661, being Tuesday, very early in the morning, there began a very great and dreadful storm of wind, accompanied with thunder, lightning, hail, and rain, which in many places were as salt as brine, which continued with a strange and unusual violence till almost night, the sad effects whereof throughout the nation are so many that a very great volume is not sufficient to contain the narrative of them, and indeed some of them are so stupendous and amazing that the report of them, though from never so authentic hands, will scarce gain credit among any but those that have an affectionate sense of the unlimited power of the Almighty, knowing and believing that there is nothing too hard for him to do. Some few of which wonderful effects we shall give a brief account of, as we have received them from persons of most unquestionable credit, in several parts of the nation. In the city of London and in Covent Garden, and other parts about London and Westminster, five or six persons were killed outright by the fall of houses and chimneys, especially one Mr. Luke Blythe, an attorney that lived at or near Stamford in the county of Lincoln, was killed that day by the fall of a riding house not far from Piccadilly, and there are some very remarkable circumstances in this man's case, which do make his death to appear at least like a most eminent judgment and severe stroke of the Lord's hand upon him. From other parts, likewise, we have received certain information that diverse persons were killed by the effects of this great wind. At Chiltenham in Gloucestershire, a maid was killed by the fall of a tree in or near the churchyard. An honest yeoman, likewise of Scaldwell in Northamptonshire, being upon a ladder to save his hovel, was blown off and fell upon a plough, died outright, and never spoke word more. Also in Tewkesbury at Gloucestershire, a man was blown from an house and broken to pieces. At Ellsbury, likewise in the same county, a woman was killed by the fall of tiles or bricks from a house, and not far from the same place, a girl was killed by the fall of a tree. Near Northampton, a man was killed by the fall of a great barn. Near Colchester, a young man was killed by the fall of a windmill. Not far from Ipswich in Suffolk, a man was killed by the fall of a barn. And about two miles from the said town of Ipswich, a man was killed by the fall of a tree. At Langton, or near it, in the county of Leicester, one, Mr. Roberts, had a windmill blown down, in which were three men and by the fall of it one of them was killed outright a second had his back broken and the other had his arm or leg struck off and both of them according to our best information are since dead several other instances there are of the like nature but it would be too tedious to mention them let these therefore suffice to stir us up to repentance, lest we likewise perish. There are also many effects of this storm, which are of another nature, whereof we shall give this following brief account. 
The Wind hath very much prejudiced many churches in several parts of the nation. At Tewkesbury, in Gloucestershire, it blew down a very fair window belonging to the church there, both the glass and the stone work also. The doors likewise of that church were blown open, much of the lead torn up, and some part of a fair pinnacle thrown down. Also at Red Marley and Newen, not far from Tewkesbury, their churches are extremely broken and shattered, if not a considerable part of them blown down. The like was done to most, if not all, the public meeting places at Gloucester City. And it is reported that some hundreds of pounds will not suffice to repair the damage done to the cathedral at Worcester, especially in that part that is over the choir. The like fate happened to many more of them, as Hereford and Leighton Beaudesart and Bedfordshire, and Eton Silken in the same county, where they had newly erected a very fair cross of stone, which the wind blew down, and as some of the inhabitants did observe, that was the first damage which that town sustained by the storm, though afterwards in other respects also they were in the same condition with their neighbours. The steeples also and other parts of the churches of Shenley, Wadden, and Woolston, in the county of Bucks, have been very much rent and torn by the wind. The spire of Finchenfield steeple in the county of Essex was blown down, and it broke through the body of the church and spoiled many of the pews. Some hundreds of pounds will not repair that loss. But that which is most remarkable of this kind is the fall of that most famous spire or pinnacle of the Tower Church in Ipswich. It was blown down upon the body of the church and fell reversed, the sharp end of the shaft striking through the leads on the south side of the church, carried much of the timber work down before it into the alley just behind the pulpit and took off one side of the sounding-board over the pulpit. It shattered many pews. The weathercock and the iron upon which it stood broke off as it fell, but the narrowest part of the woodwork upon which the fane stood fell into the alley, broke quite through a gravestone, and ran shoring under two coffins, that had been placed there one on another. That part of the spire which was plucked up was about three yards deep in the earth, and it is believed some part of it is yet behind in the ground. Some hundreds of pounds will not make good the detriment done to the church by the fall of this pinnacle. Very great prejudice has been done to private houses, many of them blown down, and others extremely shattered and torn. It is thought that five thousand pounds will not make good the repairs at Audley End House, which belongs to the Earl of Suffolk. A good part also of the crown office in the temple is blown down. The instances of this kind are so many and so obvious that it would needlessly take up too much time to give the reader an account of the collection of them. Only there has been such a wonderful destruction of barns that, looking so much like a judgment from the Lord, who the last year took away our corn, and this our barns, we cannot but give a short account of some part of that intelligence which hath come to our hands of that nature. A gentleman of good account in Ipswich affirms that in a few miles riding that day there was eleven barns and outhouses blown down in the road within his view, and within a very few miles of Ipswich roundabout 
above thirty barns, and many of them with corn in them, were blown down. At Southland, not far from the place before mentioned, many new houses and barns, built since a late fire that happened there, are blown down, as also a salt house is destroyed there, and a thousand pounds, as it is believed, will not make up that particular loss. From Tewkesbury it is certified that an incredible number of barns have been blown down in the small towns and villages thereabouts. At Twinning, at least eleven barns are blown down. In Ashchurch Parish, seven or eight. At Lee, five. At Norton, a very great number, three whereof belonging to one man. The Great Abbey Barn, also at Tewkesbury, is blown down. It is credibly reported that within a very few miles circumference in Worcestershire, about a hundred and forty barns were blown down. At Finchinfield in Essex, which is but an ordinary village, about sixteen barns were blown down. Also at a town called Wilchamstead, in the county of Bedford, a very small village, fifteen barns at least are blown down, but especially the parsonage barns went to rack in many places throughout the land. In a few miles compass of Bedfordshire, and so in Northamptonshire, and other places eight, ten, and twelve are blown down and at yielding parsonage in the county of Bedford, out of which was thrust by oppression and violence the late incumbent, all the barns belonging to it are down. The instances also of this kind are innumerable, which we shall therefore forbear to make further mention of. We have also a large account of the blowing down of a very great and considerable number of fruit trees, and other trees in several parts. We shall only pick out two or three passages, which are the most remarkable. In the counties of Gloucester, Hereford, and Worcester, several persons have lost whole orchards of fruit trees, and many particular men's loss hath amounted to the value of forty or fifty pounds at the least, merely by destruction of their fruit trees, and so in other parts of England, proportionably, the like damage hath been sustained in this respect. And as for other trees, there has been a great destruction made of them in many places by this storm. Several were blown down at Hampton Court, and three thousand brave oaks at least, but in one principal part of the forest of Dean, belonging to his majesty. In a little grove at Ipswich, belonging to the lord of Hereford, which, together with the spire of the steeple before mentioned, were the most considerable ornaments of that town, are blown down at least two hundred goodly trees, one of which was an ash, which had ten load of wood upon it. There are now few trees left there. In Brampton Bryan Park in the county of Hereford, belonging to Sir Edward Harley, one of the late knights of the Bath, above thirteen hundred trees are blown down, and above six hundred in Hopton Park, not far from it. And thus it is proportionably in most places where this storm was felt. And the truth is, the damage which the people of this nation have sustained upon all accounts by this storm is not easily to be valued. Some sober and discreet people who have endeavoured to compute the loss of the several counties, one with another, by the destruction of houses and barns, the blowing away of hovels and ricks of corn, the falling of trees, etc., do believe it can come to little less 
than two millions of money. There are yet behind many particulars of a distinct nature from those that have been spoken of, some whereof are very wonderful, and call for a very serious observation of them. In the cities of London and Westminster, especially on the bridge and near Wallingford House, several persons were blown down one on the top of another. In Hertfordshire, a man was taken up, carried a pole in length, and blown over a very high hedge, and the like in other places. The water in the river of Thames and other places was in a very strange manner blown up into the air. Yea, in the new pond in James Park, the fish, to the number of at least two hundred, were blown out and lay by the bankside, whereof many were eyewitnesses. At Morclack in Surrey, the birds, as they attempted to fly, were beaten down to the ground by the violence of the wind. At Epping, in the county of Essex, a very great oak was blown down, which of itself was raised again, and doth grow firmly at this day. At Taunton, a great tree was blown down, the upper part whereof rested upon a brick or stone wall, and after a little time, by the force of the wind, the lower part of the tree was blown quite over the wall. In the city of Hereford, several persons were, by the violence of the wind, borne up from the ground. One man, as it is credibly reported, at least six yards. The great fane at Whitehall was blown down, and one of the four which were upon the white tower, and two more of them strangely bent, which are to be seen at this day, to the admiration of all that behold them. The several triumphant arches in the city of London were much shattered and torn. That in Leadenhall Street lost the king's arms, and many other rare pieces that were affixed to it. That in Cheapside, which represented the church, suffered very much by the fury of the storm and a great part of that in Fleet Street, which represented plenty, was blown down. But, blessed be God, none, as we hear of, either were killed or hurt by the fall of it. The wind was so strong that it blew down several carts loaded with hay in the road between Barnet and London, and in other roads leading to the city of London. Norwich coach with four or six horses was not able to come towards London, but stayed by the way till the storm was somewhat abated. It is also credibly reported that all, or some of the heads which were set up upon Westminster Hall, were that day blown down. There was a very dreadful lightning which did at first accompany the storm, and by it some of his majesty's household conceive that the fire which happened at Whitehall that morning was kindled, as also that at Greenwich, by which, as we are informed, seven or eight houses were burnt down. Thus far the author of Mirabilis Anis. End of Section 4, the first part of Chapter 4. Section 5 of The Storm by Daniel Defoe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Conclusion of Chapter 4 tis very observable that this storm blew from the same quarter as the last, and that they had less of it northward than here, in which they were very much alike. Now, 
as these storms were perhaps very furious in some places, yet they neither came up to the violence of this, nor any way to be compared for the extent, and when ruinous in one county, were hardly heard of in the next. But this terrible night shook all Europe, and how much farther it extended, he only knows who has his way in the whirlwind, and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. As this storm was first felt from the west, some have conjectured that the first generation, or rather collection of materials, was from the continent of America, possibly from that part of Florida and Virginia, where, if we respect natural causes, the confluence of vapors raised by the sun from the vast and unknown lakes and inland seas of water, which, as some relate, are incredibly large, as well as numerous, might afford sufficient matter for the exhalation, and, where, time adding to the preparation, God, who has generally confined his providence to the chain of natural causes, might muster together those troops of combustion till they made a sufficient army duly proportioned to the expedition designed. I am the rather inclined to this opinion, because we are told they felt upon that coast an unusual tempest a few days before the fatal 27th of November. I confess I have never studied the motion of the clouds so nicely as to calculate how long time this army of terror might take up in its furious march. Possibly the velocity of its motion might not be so great at its first setting out as it was afterward, as a horse that is to run a race does not immediately put himself into the height of his speed, and though it may be true that by the length of the way the force of the wind spends itself, and so by degrees ceases as the vapour finds more room for dilation, besides, yet we may suppose a conjunction of some confederate matter which might fall in with it by the way, or which meeting it at its arrival here might join forces in executing the commission received from above all natural causes being allowed a subserviency to the direction of the great supreme cause. Yet where the vast collection of matter had its first motion, as it did not take all motion in one and the same moment, so when the parts had felt the influence as they advanced and pressed those before them, the violence must increase in proportion and thus we may conceive that the motion might not have arrived at its meridian violence till it reached our island, and even then it blew some days with more than common fury, yet much less than that last night of its force. And even that night the violence was not at its extremity till about an hour before sunrise, and then it continued declining, though it blew a full storm for four days after it. Thus Providence, by whose special direction the quantity and conduct of this judgment was managed, seemed to proportion things so, as that by the course of things the proportion of matter being suited to distance of place, the motion should arrive at its full force just at the place where its execution was to begin. As then our island was the first, this way, to receive the impressions of the violent motion, it had the terriblest effects here, and continuing its steady course, 
we find it carried a true line clear over the continent of Europe, traversed England, France, Germany, the Baltic Sea, and passing the northern continent of Sweden, Finland, Muscovy, and part of Tartary, must at last lose itself in the vast northern ocean, where man never came, and ship never sailed, and its violence could have no effect but upon the vast mountains of ice and the huge drifts of snow, in which abyss of moisture and cold, it is very probable the force of it was checked, and the world restored to calmness and quiet and in this circle of fury it might find its end not far off from where it had its beginning, the fierceness of the motion perhaps not arriving to a period, till having passed the pole, it reached again the northern parts of America. The effects of this impetuous course are the proper subjects of this book, and what they might be before our island felt its fury who can tell those unhappy wretches who had the misfortune to meet it in its first approach can tell us little having been hurried by its irresistible force directly into eternity how many they are we cannot pretend to give an account we are told of about seventeen ships which, having been out at sea, are never heard of, which is the common way of discourse of ships foundered in the ocean. And, indeed, all we can say of them is the fearful exit they have made among the mountains of waters can only be duly reflected on by those who have seen those wonders of God in the deep. Yet, I cannot omit here to observe that this loss was in all probability much less than it would otherwise have been, because the winds having blown with very great fury at the same point for near fourteen days before the violence grew to its more uncommon height, all those ships which were newly gone to sea were forced back, of which some were driven into Plymouth and Falmouth, who had been above a hundred and fifty leagues at sea. Others, which had been farther, took sanctuary in Ireland. On the other hand, all those ships which were homeward bound, and were within five hundred leagues of the English shore, had been hurried so furiously on a it, as the seamen say, that they had reached their port before the extremity of the storm came on, so that the sea was, as it were, swept clean of all shipping. Those which were coming home were blown home before their time. Those that had attempted to put to sea were driven back again in spite of all their skill and courage, for the wind had blown so very hard directly into the channel that there was no possibility of their keeping the sea whose course was not right before the wind. On the other hand, these two circumstances had filled out all our ports with unusual fleets of ships, either just come home or outward bound, and consequently the loss among them was very terrible, and the havoc it made among them though it was not so much as everybody expected, was such as no age or circumstance can ever parallel, and we hope will never feel again. Nay, so high the winds blew even before that we call the storm, that had not that intolerable tempest followed so soon after, we should have counted those winds extraordinary high, and any one may judge of the truth of this from these very few particulars, that the Russia fleet, composed of near a hundred sail, which happened to be then upon the coast, 
was absolutely dispersed and scattered. Some got into Newcastle, some into Hull, and some into Yarmouth roads. Two foundered in the sea. One or two more run ashore and were lost. And the reserve frigate, their convoy, foundered in Yarmouth roads, all her men being lost, and no boat from the shore durst go off to relieve her, though it was in the daytime, but all her men perished. In the same previous storms, the man of war was lost off of Harwich, but by the help of smaller vessels, most of her men were saved. And so high the winds blew for near a fortnight, that no ship stirred out of harbour, and all the vessels, great or small, that were out at sea, made for some port or other for shelter. In this juncture of time, it happened that, together with the Russia fleet, a great fleet of laden colliers, near four hundred sail, were just put out of the river Tyne, and these being generally deep and unwieldy ships, met with hard measure, though not so fatal to them as was expected. Some of them, as could run in for Humber, where a great many were lost afterwards, as I shall relate in its course. Some got shelter under the highlands of Cromer, and the northern shores of the county of Norfolk, and the greater number reached into Yarmouth Roads so that when the great storm came, our ports round the sea-coast of England were exceeding full of ships of all sorts, a brief account whereof take as follows. At Grimsby, Hull, and the other roads of the Humber lay about eighty sail, great and small, of which about fifty were colliers, and part of the Russia fleet, as aforesaid. In Yarmouth roads, there rode at least four hundred sail, being most of them laid in colliers, Russia men, and coasters from Lynn and Hull. In the river of Thames, at the Nore, lay about twelve sail of Queen's hired ships and store ships, and only two men of war. Sir Cloudsley Shovel was just arrived from the Mediterranean with the Royal Navy. Part of them lay at St. Helens, part in the Downs, and with twelve of the biggest ships he was coming round the foreland to bring them into Chatham, and when the great storm began was at an anchor at the Gunfleet, from whence the association was driven off from sea as far as the coast of Norway. What became of the rest, I refer to a chapter by itself. At Gravesend there rode five East India men, and about thirty sail of other merchant men, all outward bound. In the Downs, one hundred and sixty sail of merchant ships outward bound, besides the part of the fleet which came in with Sir Cloudsley Shovel, which consisted of about eighteen men of war, with tenders and victuallers. At Portsmouth and Cowes there lay three fleets. First, a fleet of transports and tenders, who with Admiral Dilks brought the forces from Ireland that were to accompany the King of Spain to Lisbon. Secondly, a great fleet of victuallers, tenders, store-ships and transports, which lay ready for the same voyage, together with about forty merchant ships, who lay for the benefit of their convoy. And the third article was the remainder of the grand fleet, which came in with Sir Cloudsley Shovel, in all almost three hundred sail, great and small. In Plymouth Sound, Falmouth and Milford Havens were, particularly, several small fleets of merchant ships, 
driven in for shelter and harbour from the storm, most homeward bound from the islands and colonies of America. The Virginia fleet, Barbados fleet, and some East India men lay scattered in all our ports, and in Kinsale in Ireland there lay near eighty sail homeward bound and richly laden. At Bristol about twenty sail of home bound West India men, not yet unladen. In Holland the fleet of transports for Lisbon waited for the King of Spain, and several English men of war lay at Halvwit Sluice. The Dutch fleet from the Texel lay off Cadsent, with their forces on board, under the Admiral Collenburge. Both these fleets made a hundred and eighty sail. I think I may very safely affirm that hardly in the memory of the oldest man living was a juncture of time when an accident of this nature could have happened that so much shipping, laden out and home, ever was in port at one time. No man will wonder that the damages of this nation were so great, if they consider these unhappy circumstances. It should rather be wondered at that we have no more disasters to account to posterity, but that the navigation of this country came off so well. And therefore some people have excused the extravagancies of the Paris Gazetteer, who affirmed in print that there was thirty thousand seamen lost in the several ports of England, and three hundred sail of ships, which they say was a probable conjecture, and that considering the multitude of shipping the openness of the roads in the Downs, Yarmouth, and the Nore, and the prodigious fury of the wind, any man would have guessed the same as he. Tis certain it is a wonderful thing to consider that, especially in the Downs and Yarmouth roads, anything should be safe. All men that know how wild a road the first is, and what crowds of ships there lay in the last, how almost everything quitted the road, and neither anchor nor cable would hold, must wonder what shift or what course the mariners could direct themselves to for safety. Some which had not a mast standing, nor an anchor or cable left them, went out to sea wherever the winds drove them, and lying like a trough in the water, wallowed about till the winds abated, and after were driven some into one port, some into another as providence guided them. In short, horror and confusion seized upon all, whether on shore or at sea. No pen can describe it, no tongue can express it, no thought conceive it, unless some of those who were in the extremity of it, and who being touched with a due sense of the sparing mercy of their Maker, retained the deep impressions of His goodness upon their minds, though the danger be past, and of those I doubt the number is but few. End of the conclusion of chapter 4section 6 of the storm by daniel defoe this librivox recording is in the public domain on the effects of the storm damages in the city of london etc the particular dreadful effects of this tempest are the subject of the ensuing part of this history, and though the reader is not to expect that all the particulars can be put into this account, and perhaps many very remarkable passages may never come to our knowledge, 
yet as we have endeavoured to furnish ourselves with the most authentic accounts we could from all parts of the nation and a great many worthy gentlemen have contributed their assistance in various and some very exact relations and curious remarks so we pretend not to be meanly furnished for this work some gentlemen whose accounts are but of common and trivial damages we hope will not take it ill from the author if they are not inserted at large for that we are willing to put in nothing here common with other accidents of like nature or which may not be worthy of a history and a historian to record them nothing but what may serve to assist in convincing posterity that this was the most violent tempest the world ever saw from hence twill follow that those towns who only had their houses untiled their barns and hovels leveled with the ground and the like will find very little notice taken of them in this account because if these were to be the subject of a history i presume it must be equally voluminous with fox crimston hollingshead or stowe nor shall i often trouble the reader with the multitude or magnitude of trees blown down whole parks ruined fine walks defaced and orchards laid flat and the like and though i had myself the curiosity to count the number of trees in a circuit i rode over most part of kent in which being tired with the number i left off reckoning after i had gone on to seventeen thousand and though i have great reason to believe i did not observe one half of the quantity yet in some parts of england as in devonshire especially and the counties of worcester gloucester and hereford which are full of very large orchards of fruit trees they had much more mischief in the pursuit of this work i shall divide it into the following chapters or sections that i may put it into as good order as possible one of the damage in the city of london etc two of the damage in the counties three of the damage on the water in the royal navy four of the damage on the water to shipping in general five of the damage by earthquake six of the damage by high tides seven remarkable providences and deliverances eight hardened and blasphemous contemners both of the storm and its effects nine some calculations of damage sustained ten the conclusion we had designed a chapter for the damages abroad and have been at no small charge to procure the particulars from foreign parts which are now doing in a very authentic manner but as the world has been long expecting this work and several gentlemen who were not a little contributing to the information of the author being unwilling to stay any longer for the account it was resolved to put it into the press without any farther delay and if the foreign accounts can be obtained in time they shall be a supplement to the work if not some other method shall be found out to make them public one of the damages in the city of london and parts adjacent indeed the city was a strange spectacle the morning after the storm as soon as the people could put their heads out of doors though i believe everybody expected the destruction was bad enough yet i question very much if anybody believed the hundredth part of what they saw the streets lay so covered with tiles and slates from the tops of the houses 
especially in the out parts, that the quantity is incredible, and the houses were so universally stripped that all the tiles in fifty miles round would be able to repair but a small part of it. Something may be guessed at on this head from the sudden rise of the price of tiles, which rise from twenty-one shillings per thousand to six pounds for plain tiles, and from fifty shillings per thousand for pantiles to ten pounds, and bricklayers labor to five shillings per day, and though after the first hurry the prices fell again, it was not that the quantity was supplied, but because, first, the charge was so extravagant that an universal neglect of themselves appeared both in landlord and tenant. An incredible number of houses remained all the winter uncovered and exposed to all the inconveniences of wet and cold, and are so even at the writing of this chapter. 2. Those people who found it absolutely necessary to cover their houses, but were unwilling to go to the extravagant price of tiles, changed their covering to that of wood, as a present expedient, till the season for making of tiles should come on, and the first hurry being over, the prices abate. And tis on this score that we see to this day whole ranks of buildings, as in Christ Church Hospital, the Temple, Ast's Hospital, Old Street, Hogsden Squares, and infinite other places, covered entirely with deal boards, and are like to continue so perhaps a year or two longer, for want of tiles. These two reasons reduce the tile merchants to sell at a more moderate price. But tis not an irrational suggestion that all the tiles which shall be made this whole summer will not repair the damage in the covering of houses within the circumference of the city and ten miles round. The next article in our street damage was the fall of chimneys, and as the chimneys in the city buildings are built in large stacks, the houses being so high, the fall of them had the more power by their own weight to demolish the houses they fell upon. Tis not possible to give a distinct account of the number or particular stacks of chimneys which fell in this fatal night, but the reader may guess by this particular that in Cambray House, commonly so called, a great house near Islington, belonging to the family of the Comptons, earls of Northampton, but now let out into tenements. The collector of these remarks counted eleven or thirteen stacks of chimneys, either wholly thrown in, or the greatest parts of them, at least, what was exposed to the wind, blown off. I have heard persons who pretended to observe the desolation of that terrible night very nicely, and who, by what they had seen and inquired into, thought themselves capable of making some calculations, affirm they could give an account of above two thousand stacks of chimneys blown down in and about London, besides gable ends of houses, some whole roofs, and sixteen or twenty whole houses in the outparts. Under the disaster of this article, it seems most proper to place the loss of the people's lives, who fell in this calamity, since most of those who had the misfortune to be killed were buried or beaten to pieces with the rubbish of the several stacks of chimneys that fell. Of these, our weekly bills of mortality gave us an account of twenty-one, besides such as were drowned in the river and never found, and besides above two hundred people, 
very much wounded and maimed. One woman was killed by the fall of a chimney in or near the palace of St. James, and a stack of chimneys falling in the new unfinished building there, and carried away a piece of the coin of the house. Nine soldiers were hurt with the fall of the roof of the guardhouse at Whitehall, but none of them died. A distiller in Duke Street with his wife and maidservant were all buried in the rubbish of a stack of chimneys, which forced all the floors and broke down to the bottom of the house. The wife was taken out alive, though very much bruised, but her husband and the maid lost their lives. One Mr. Dyer, a plasterer in Fetter Lane, finding the danger he was in by the shaking of the house, jumped out of bed to save himself, and had, in all probability, time enough to have got out of the house, but staying to strike a light, a stack of chimneys fell in upon him, killed him, and wounded his wife. Two boys at one Mr. Purfoy's in Cross Street, Hatton Garden, were both killed and buried in the rubbish of a stack of chimneys, and a third very much wounded. A woman in Jewin Street and two persons more near Aldersgate Street were killed. The first, as it is reported, by venturing to run out of the house into the street, and the other two by the fall of a house. In Threadneedle Street, one Mr. Simpson, a scrivener being in bed and fast asleep, heard nothing of the storm. But the rest of the family being more sensible of danger, some of them went up and waked him, and telling him their own apprehensions, pressed him to rise. But he, too, fatally sleepy, and consequently unconcerned at the danger, told them he did not apprehend anything, and so, notwithstanding all their persuasions, could not be prevailed with to rise, they had not been gone many minutes out of his chamber before the chimneys fell in and broke through the roof over him and killed him in his bed. A carpenter in Whitecross Street was killed almost in the same manner by a stack of chimneys of the Swan Tavern, which fell into his house. It was reported that his wife earnestly desired him not to go to bed and had prevailed upon him to sit up till near two o'clock, but then, finding himself very heavy, he would go to bed against all his wife's entreaties, after which she waked him and desired him to rise, which he refused, being something angry for being disturbed, and going to sleep again was killed in his bed, and his wife, who would not go to bed, escaped. In this manner our weekly bills gave us a count of twenty-one persons killed in the city of London, and parts adjacent. Some of our printed accounts give us larger and plainer accounts of the loss of lives than I will venture to affirm for truth. As for several houses near Moorfields, leveled with the ground, Fourteen people drowned in a weary going to Gravesend, and five in a weary from Chelsea. Not that it is not very probable to be true, but as I resolve not to hand anything to posterity, but what comes very well attested, I omit such relations as I have not extraordinary assurance as to the fact. The fall of brick walls by the fury of this tempest in and about London would make a little book of itself, and as this affects the out parts chiefly, where the gardens and yards are walled in, so few such have escaped. At St. James a considerable part of the garden wall. At Greenwich Park there are several pieces of the wall down for an hundred rods in a place, and some much more, at Battersea, Chelsea, Putney, 
at Clapham, at Deptford, at Hackney, Islington, Hogsden, Woods Close, by St. John Street. And on every side of the city, the walls of the gardens have generally felt the shock, and lie flat on the ground, twenty, thirty rod of walling in a place. The public edifices of the city come next under our consideration, and they have had their share in the fury of this terrible night. A part of Her Majesty's Palace, as is before observed, with a stack of chimneys in the centre of the new buildings, then not quite finished, fell with such a terrible noise as very much alarmed the whole household. The roof of the guardhouse at Whitehall, as is also observed before, was quite blown off, and the great vane or weathercock at Whitehall blown down. The lead on the tops of the churches and other buildings was in many places rolled up like a roll of parchment, and blown in some places clear off the buildings, as at Westminster Abbey, St. Andrew's Holborn, Christ Church Hospital, and abundance of other places. Two of the new-built turrets on the top of St. Mary Aldermary Church were blown off, whereof one fell upon the roof of the church. Of eight pinnacles on the top of St. Albans Wood Street, five of them were blown down. Part of one of the spires of St. Mary Overies blown off. Four pinnacles on the steeple of St. Michael Crooked Lane blown quite off. The veins and spindles of the weathercocks in many places bent quite down, as on St. Michael Cornhill, St. Sepulchre's, the Tower, and divers other places. It was very remarkable that the bridge over the Thames received but little damage, and not in proportion to what in common reason might be expected, since the buildings there stand high, and are not sheltered as they are in the streets one by another. If I may be allowed to give this philosophical account of it, I hope it may not be absurd, that the indraft of the arches underneath the houses, giving vent to the air, it passed there with a more than common current, and consequently relieved the buildings by diverting the force of the storm, I ask pardon of the ingenious reader for this opinion, if it be not regular, and only present it to the world for want of a better. If those better furnished that way will supply us with a truer account, I shall withdraw mine and submit to theirs. The fact, however, is certain that the houses on the bridge did not suffer in proportion to the other places though all must allow, they do not seem to be stronger built than other streets of the same sort. Another observation I cannot but make, to which, as I have hundreds of instances, so I have many more witnesses to the truth of fact, and the uncommon experiment has made it the more observed. The wind blew during the whole storm, between the points of south-west and north-west. Not that I mean it blew at all these points, but I take a latitude of eight points to avoid exceptions, and to confirm my argument, since what I am insisting upon could not be a natural cause from the winds blowing in any of those particular points. If a building stood north and south, it must be a consequence that the east side slope of the roof must be the lee side, lie out of the wind, be weathered by the ridge, and consequently receive no damage in a direct line. But against this rational way of arguing, we are convinced by demonstration and experiment, after which argument must be silent 
it was not in one place or two, but in many places, that where a building stood ranging north and south, the sides or slopes of the roof to the east and the west, the east side of the roof would be stripped and untiled by the violence of the wind, and the west side, which lay open to the wind, be sound and untouched. This, I conceive, must happen either where the building had some open part, as windows or doors to receive the wind in the inside, which being pushed forward by the succeeding particles in the air, must force its way forward, and so lift off the tiling on the leeward side of the building, or it must happen from the position of such building near some other high place or building, where the wind being repulsed must be forced back again in eddies, and consequently taking the tiles from the lower side of the roof, rip them up with the more ease. However it was, it appeared in many places, the windward side of the roof would be whole, and the leeward side, or the side from the wind, be untiled. In other places, a high building next the wind has been not much hurt, and a lower building on the leeward side of the high one, clean ripped, and hardly a tile left upon it. This is plain in the building of Christ Church Hospital, in London, where the building on the west and south side of the cloister was at least twenty-five foot higher than the east side, and yet the roof on the lower side, on the east, was quite untiled by the storm, and remains at the writing of this covered with deal boards above an hundred foot in length. The blowing down of trees may come in for another article in this part, of which, in proportion to the quantity, here was as much as in any part of England. Some printed accounts tell us of seventy trees in moorfields, blown down, which may be true, but that some of them were three yards about, as is affirmed by the authors, I cannot allow. Above a hundred elms in St. James Park, some whereof were of such growth, as they tell us, they were planted by Cardinal Wolseley. Whether that part of it be true or not, is little to the matter, but only to imply that they were very great trees, about bombs, commonly called Whitmore House, there were above two hundred trees blown down, and some of them of extraordinary size, broken off in the middle. And t'was observed that in the morning after the storm was abated, it blew so hard, the women who usually go for milk to the cow-keepers in the villages round the city, were not able to go along with their pails on their heads, and one, that was more hardy than the rest, was blown away by the fury of the storm, and forced into a pond, but by struggling hard got out, and avoided being drowned, and some that ventured out with milk the evening after, had their pails and milk blown off from their heads. Tis impossible to enumerate the particulars of the damage suffered, and of the accidents which happened under these several heads, in and about the city of London. The houses looked like skeleton, and an universal air of horror seemed to sit on the countenances of the people. All business seemed to be laid aside for the time, and people were generally intent upon getting help to repair their habitations. It pleased God so to direct things that there fell no rain in any considerable quantity, except what fell the same night, or the ensuing day. For near three weeks after the storm, though it was a time of the year that is generally dripping, had a wet, rainy season followed the storm, the damage which 
would have been suffered in and about this city to household goods, furniture, and merchandise would have been incredible and might have equaled all the rest of the calamity. But the weather proved fair and temperate for near a month after the storm, which gave people a great deal of leisure in providing themselves shelter and fortifying their houses against the accidents of weather by deal boards, old tiles, pieces of sailcloth, tarpaulin, and the like. End of section six. Section seven of The Storm by Daniel Defoe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Of the effects of the storm, damages in the country. As the author of this was an eyewitness and sharer of the particulars in the former chapter, so to furnish the reader with accounts as authentic, and which he has as much cause to depend upon as if he had seen them, he has the several particulars following from eye-witnesses, and that in such a manner, as I think their testimony is not to be questioned, most of the gentlemen being of piety and reputation. And, as a publication was made to desire all persons who were willing to contribute to the forwarding of this work, and to transmit the memory of so signal a judgment to posterity, that they would be pleased to send up such authentic accounts of the mischiefs, damages, and disasters in their respective counties that the world might rely on. It cannot, without a great breach of charity, be supposed that men moved by such principles without any private interest or advantage would forge anything to impose upon the world and abuse mankind in ages to come. Interest, parties, strife, faction, and particular malice, with all the scurvy circumstances attending such things, may prompt men to strain a tale beyond its real extent, but that men should invent a story to amuse posterity in a case where they have no manner of motive, where the only design is to preserve the remembrance of divine vengeance and put our children in mind of God's judgments upon their sinful fathers. This would be telling a lie for God's sake, and doing evil for the sake of itself, which is a step beyond the devil. Besides, as most of our relators have not only given us their names and signed the accounts they have sent, but have also given us leave to hand their names down to posterity with the record of the relation they give. We would hope no man will be so uncharitable to believe that men would be forward to set their names to a voluntary untruth and have themselves recorded to posterity for having, without motion, hope, reward, or any other reason, imposed a falsity upon the world, and dishonoured our relation with the useless banter of an untruth. We cannot therefore but think that, as the author believes himself sufficiently backed by the authority of the vouchers he presents, so after what has been here premised, no man will have any room to suspect us of forgery. The ensuing relation, therefore, as to damages in the country, 
shall consist chiefly of letters from the respective places where such things have happened, only that, as all our letters are not concise enough to be printed as they are, where it is otherwise the letter is digested into a relation only, in which the reader is assured we have always kept close to the matter of fact. And first I shall present such accounts as are entire, and related by men of letters, principally by the clergy, which shall be given you in their own words. The first is from Stowmarket in Suffolk, where, by the violence of the storm, the finest spire in that county, and but new-built, viz. within thirty years, was overthrown and fell upon the church the letter is signed by the reverend minister of the place and vouched by two of the principal inhabitants as follows sir having seen an advertisement of a design to perpetuate the remembrance of the late dreadful storm by publishing a collection of all the remarkable accidents occasioned by it and supposing the damage done to our church to be none of the least we were willing to contribute something to your design by sending you an account thereof as follows we had formerly a spire of timber covered with lead of the height of seventy-seven foot which, being in danger of falling, was taken down, and in the year 1674, with the addition of ten loads of new timber, twenty-one thousand and eight hundred weight of lead, a new one was erected, a hundred foot high from the steeple, with a gallery at the height of forty foot all open, wherein hung a clock bell, of between two and three hundred weight. The spire stood but eight yards above the roof of the church, and yet by the extreme violence of the storm, a little before six in the morning, the spire was thrown down, and carrying with it all the battlements on the east side, it fell upon the church at the distance of twenty-eight foot, for so much is the distance between the steeple and the first breach, which is on the north side of the middle roof, of the length of seventeen foot, where it break down nine spars clean, each twenty-three foot long, and severally supported with very strong braces. The spire, inclining to the north, fell across the middle wall, and broke off at the gallery, the lower part falling in at the aforesaid breach, and the upper upon the north aisle, which is twenty-four foot wide, with a flat roof lately built, all new and very strong. It carried all before it from side to side, making a breach thirty-seven foot long, breaking in sunder two large beams that went across, which were twelve inches broad and fifteen deep, besides several other smaller. Besides these two breaches, there is a great deal of damage done by the fall of great stones upon other parts of the roof, as well as by the winds riving up the lead, and a third part of the pews broken all in pieces, everything falling into the church, except the weathercock, which was found in the churchyard at a considerable distance, in the great path that goes cross by the east end of the church. It will cost above four hundred pounds to make all good as it was before. There were three single chimneys blown down, and a stack of four more together all about the same time, and some others so shaken that they were forced to be pulled down. But we thank God nobody hurt though one bed was broken in pieces that was very oft lain in. Nobody lay in it that night. Most houses suffered something in their tiling, and generally all round the country 
there is incredible damage done to churches, houses, and barns. Samuel Farr, Vicar, John Gaudy, William Garrard. From Oxfordshire we have an account very authentic, and yet unaccountably strange, but the reverend author of the story being a gentleman whose credit we cannot dispute, in acknowledgment to his civility, and for the advantage of our true design, we give his letter also verbatim. Sir, meeting with an advertisement of yours in the Gazette of Monday last, I very much approved of the design, thinking it might be a great motive towards making people, when they hear the fate of others, return thanks to Almighty God for His providence in preserving them. I, accordingly, was resolved to send you all I knew. The place where I have for some time lived is Besselsley in Berkshire, about four miles southwest of Oxen. The wind began with us much about one of the clock in the morning, and did not do much harm, only in untiling houses, blowing down a chimney or two, without any person hurt, and a few trees. But what was the only thing that was strange, and to be observed, was a very tall elm, which was found the next morning standing, but perfectly twisted round, the root a little loosened up, but not torn up. But what happened the afternoon preceding is abundantly more surprising, and is indeed the intent of this letter. On Friday the 26th of November in the afternoon, about four of the clock, a country fellow came running to me in a great fright, and very earnestly entreated me to go and see a pillar, as he called it, in the air, in a field hard by. I went with the fellow, and when I came, found it to be a spout, marching directly with the wind, and I can think of nothing I can compare it to better than the trunk of an elephant, which it resembled, only much bigger. It was extended to a great length, and swept the ground as it went, leaving a mark behind. It crossed a field, and what was very strange, and which I should scarce have been induced to believe, had I not myself seen it, besides several countrymen who were astonished at it, meeting with an oak that stood towards the middle of the field, snapped the body of it asunder. Afterwards, crossing a road, it sucked up the water that was in the cart ruts, then, coming to an old barn, it tumbled it down, and the thatch that was on the top was carried about by the wind, which was then very high, in great confusion. After this I followed it no farther, and therefore saw no more of it, but a parishioner of mine going from hence to Hinksey, in a field about a quarter of a mile off of this place, was on the sudden knocked down, and lay upon the place till some people came by and brought him home, and he is not yet quite recovered. Having examined him, by all I can collect, both from the time and place and manner of his being knocked down, I must conclude it was done by the spout, which, if its force had not been much abated, had certainly killed him and indeed I attribute his illness more to the fright than the sudden force with which he was struck down. I will not now enter into a dissertation on the cause of spouts, but by what I can understand they are caused by nothing but the circumgyration of the clouds made by two contrary winds meeting in a point, and condensing the cloud till it falls in the shape we see it, which by the twisting motion sucks up water, and doth much mischief to ships at sea, where they happen oftener than at land. 
Whichever of the two winds prevails, as in the above mention was the southwest, at last dissolves and dissipates the cloud, and then the spout disappears. This is all I have to communicate to you, wishing you all imaginable success in your collection. Whether you insert this account I leave wholly to your own discretion, but can assure you that to most of these things, though very surprising, I was myself an eyewitness. I am, sir, your humble servant, Joseph Ralton, December 12, 1703. The judicious reader will observe here that this strange spout or cloud, or what else it may be called, was seen the evening before the great storm, from whence is confirmed what I have said before of the violent agitation of the air for some time before the tempest. A short but very regular account from Northampton the reader may take in the following letter the person being of undoubted credit and reputation in the town, and the particulars very well worth remark. Sir, having seen in the Gazette an intimation that there would be a memorial drawn up of the late terrible wind and the effects of it, and that the composer desired informations from credible persons, the better to enable him to do the same. I thought good to intimate what happened in this town and its neighborhood. 1. The weathercock of All Saints Church being placed on a mighty spindle of iron was bowed together and made useless. Many sheets of lead on that church, as also on St. Giles and St. Sepulchre's, rolled up like a scroll three windmills belonging to the town blown down to the amazement of all beholders the mighty upright post below the floor of the mills being snapped in two like a reed two entire stacks of chimneys in a house uninhabited fell on two several roofs and made a most amazing ruin in the chambers floors and even to the lower windows and wainscot splitting and tearing it as if a blow by gunpowder had happened the floods at this instant about the south bridge from a violent southwest wind rose to a great and amazing height the wind coming over or athwart large open meadows did exceeding damage in that part of the town by blowing down some whole houses carrying whole roofs at once onto the streets and very many lesser buildings of tanners fellmongers dyers glue makers etc yet through the goodness of god no person killed or maimed the mighty doors of the sessions house barred and locked forced open whereby the wind entering made a miserable havoc of the large and lofty windows a pinnacle on the guild hall with the fane was also blown down to speak of houses shattered corn ricks and hovels blown from their standings would be endless in sir thomas samwell's park a very great headed elm was blown over the park wall into the road and yet never touched the wall being carried some yards i have confined myself to this town if the composer finds anything agreeable to his design he may use it or dismiss it at his discretion such works of providence are worth recording. I am your loving friend, Ben Bullivant, Northampton, December 12, 1703. The following account 
from Barclay and other places in Gloucestershire and Somersetshire, etc., are the sad effects of the prodigious tide in the Severn. The wind blowing directly into the mouth of that channel, we call the Severn Sea, forced the waters up in such quantity that, tis allowed, the flood was eight foot higher than ever was known in the memory of man, and at one place, near Huntsbull, it drove several vessels a long way upon the land, from whence no succeeding tide rising to near that height they can never be gotten off, as will appear in the two following letters. Sir, this parish is a very large one in the county of Gloucester, on one side whereof runneth the river Severn, which by reason of the violence of the late storm beat down and tore to pieces the sea-wall, which is made of great stones, and sticks which they call rouses, a yard and half long, about the bigness of one's thigh, rammed into the ground as firmly as possible, in many places, and levelled it almost with the ground, forcing vast quantities of earth a great distance from the shore, and stones, many of which were above a hundred weight, and hereby the Severn was let in above a mile over one part of the parish, and did great damage to the land. It carried away one house which was by the seaside, and a gentleman's stable, wherein was a horse, into the next ground, and then the stable fell to pieces, and so the horse came out. There is one thing more remarkable in this parish, and tis this. Twenty-six sheets of lead, hanging all together, were blown off from the middle aisle of our church, and were carried over the north aisle, which is a very large one, without touching it, and into the churchyard, ten yards distant from the church, and they were took up, all joined together, as they were on the roof. The plumber told me that the sheets weighed each three hundred and a half, one with another. This is what is most observable in our parish. But I shall give you an account of one thing, which perhaps you may have seen from other hands, that happened in another, called Kingscut, a little village about three miles from Tedbury, and seven from us, where William Kingscut, Esquire, has many woods, among which was one grove of very tall trees, being each near eighty foot high, the which he greatly valued for the tallness and prospect of them, and therefore resolved never to cut them down. But it so happened that six hundred of them, within the compass of five acres, were wholly blown down, and supposed to be much at the same time, each tree tearing up the ground with its root, so that the roots of most of the trees, with the turf and earth around them, stood up at least fifteen or sixteen feet high. The lying down of which trees is an amazing sight to all beholders. This account was given by the gentleman himself, whom I know very well. I have no more to add, but that I am your humble servant, wishing you good success in your undertaking. Henry Head, Vicar of Barclay, January 24th. The damage of the seawall may amount to about five hundred pounds. Sir, I received a printed paper some time since, wherein I was desired to send you an account of what happened in the late storm, and I should have answered it sooner, but was willing to make some inquiry first about this county, and, by what I can hear or learn, the dismal accident of our late bishop and lady was most remarkable. 
who was killed by the fall of two chimney stacks, which fell on the roof and drove it in upon my lord's bed, forced it quite through the next floor down into the hall, and buried them both in the rubbish. And tis supposed my lord was getting up, for he was found some distance from my lady, who was found in her bed. But my lord had his morning gown on, so tis supposed he was coming from the bed, just as it fell. We had likewise two small houses, blown flat down, just as the people were gone out to a neighbor's house, and several other chimney-stacks fell down, and some through the roof, but no other accident as to death in this town or near it. Abundance of tiles are blown off, and likewise thatch in and about this town, and several houses uncovered in the country all about us. Abundance of apple and elm trees are rooted up by the ground, and also abundance of wheat and haymows blown down. At Huntsville, about twelve miles from this town, there was four or five vessels drove ashore which remained there still, and tis supposed cannot be got off. And in the same parish, the tide broke in breast high, but all the people escaped only one woman who was drowned. These are all the remarkable things that happened near us, as I can hear of, and is all but my humble service, and beg leave to subscribe myself, Sir, your most humble servant, Edith Conyers. Wells in Somersetshire, February ninth, 1703. Sir, the dreadful storm did this church but little damage, but our houses were terribly shaken hereabouts, and the tide drowned the greatest part of the sheep on our common, as it likewise did, besides many cows, between this place and Bristol, on the opposite shore of Glamorganshire, as I suppose you may also know. It brake down part of Cheapstow Bridge, or the Y. In the midst of this churchyard grew a vast tree, thought to be the most large and flourishing elm in the land, which was torn up by the roots, some of which are really bigger than one's middle, and several than a man's thigh. The compass of them, curiously interwoven with the earth, being from the surface, or turf, to the basis, full an L in depth, and eighteen foot and half in the diameter, and yet thrown up near perpendicular, the trunk, together with the loaden roots, is well judged to be thirteen ton at least, and the limbs to make six load of billets with faggots. And about two years since, one minister observed that the circumambient boughs dropped round above two hundred yards. He hath given it for a singer's seat in our said church, with this inscription thereon, November 27th, A.D., 1703, Miserere, etc. Slimberg, near Severn, December 28th, 1703. William Frith, Church Warden. Sir, by the late dreadful storm a considerable breach was made in our town wall, and part of the church steeple blown down, besides most of the inhabitants suffered very much by untiling their houses, etc., and abundance of trees uprooted. At the same time our river overflowed, and drowned the low grounds of both sides of the town, whereby several hundreds of sheep were lost, and some cattle. In one of our market-boats lifted upon our quay. This is a true account of most of our damages. I am your humble servant, William Jones. Cardiff, January 10th, 1703.
Honoured Sir, In obedience to your request, I have here sent you a particular account of the damages sustained in our parish by the late violent storm. And because that of our church is the most material which I have to impart to you, I shall therefore begin with it. It is the fineness of our church which magnifies our present loss, for in the whole it is a large and noble structure, composed within and without of ashlar, curiously wrought, and consisting of a stately roof in the middle, and two aisles running a considerable length from one end of it to the other, making a very beautiful figure. It is also adorned with twenty-eight admired and celebrated windows, which, for the variety and fineness of the painted glass that was in them, do justly attract the eyes of all curious travellers to inspect and behold them, nor is it more famous for its glass than newly renowned for the beauty of its seats and paving, both being chiefly the noble gift of that pious and worthy gentleman, Andrew Barker, Esquire the late deceased lord of the manor, so that all things considered it does equal, at least if not exceed, any parochial church in England. Now that part of it which most of all felt the fury of the winds was a large middle west window, in dimension about fifteen foot wide, and twenty-five foot high. It represents the general judgment and is so fine a piece of art that fifteen hundred pounds has formerly been bidden for it, a price, though very tempting, yet were the parishioners so just and honest as to refuse it. The upper part of this window, just above the place where our Saviour's picture is drawn sitting on a rainbow, and the earth his footstool, is entirely ruined and both sides are so shattered and torn, especially the left, that upon a general computation, a fourth part at least is blown down and destroyed. The like fate was another west window on the left side of the former, in dimension about ten foot broad and fifteen foot high, sustained. The upper half of which is totally broke, except one stone mono. Now, if this were but ordinary glass, we might quickly compute what our repairs would cost. But we the more lament our misfortune herein, because the paint of these two, as of all the other windows in our church, is stained through the body of the glass, so that, if that be true, which is generally said, that this art is lost, then we have an irretrievable loss. There are other damages about our church, which, though not so great as the former, do yet as much testify how strong and boisterous the winds were, for they unbedded three sheets of lead upon the uppermost roof, and rolled them up like so much paper. Over the church porch, a large pinnacle and two battlements were blown down upon the leads of it, but resting there, and their fall being short, these will be repaired with little cost. This is all I have to say concerning our church. Our houses come next to be considered, and here I may tell you that thanks be to God, the effects of the storm were not so great as they have been in many other places. Several chimneys and tiles and slats were thrown down, but nobody killed or wounded. Some of the poor, because their houses were thatched, were the greatest sufferers. But to be particular herein would be very frivolous as well as vexatious. One instance of note ought not to be omitted. On Saturday the 26th, being the day after the storm, about two o'clock in the afternoon, without any previous warning, 
a sudden flash of lightning, with a short but violent clap of thunder, immediately following it, like the discharge of ordinance, fell upon a new and strong-built house in the middle of our town, and, at the same time, disjointed two chimneys, melted some of the lead of an upper window, and struck the mistress of the house into a swoon. But this, as appeared afterwards, proved the effect more of fear than of any real considerable hurt to be found about her. I have nothing more to add, unless it be the fall of several trees and ricks of hay among us, but these being so common everywhere, and not very many in number here, I shall conclude this tedious scribble, and subscribe myself, Sir, your most obedient and humble servant, Edward Shipton, Vicar, Fairford, Gloucester, January, 1703-1704. End of section 7section 8 of the storm by daniel defoe this librivox recording is in the public domain the following letters though in a homely style are written by very honest plain and observing persons to whom entire credit may be given bruton sir some time since I received a letter from you to give you an account of the most particular things that happened in the late dreadful tempest of wind, and in the first place is the copy of a letter from a brother of mine that was an exciseman of Axbridge, in the west of our county of Somerset. These are his words. <clears throat> What I know of the winds in these parts are that it broke down many trees, and that the house of one Richard Hendon, of Charter House on Mendip, called Piney, was almost blown down, and in saving their house, they, and the servants, and others, heard grievous cries and screeches in the air. The tower of Compton Bishop was much shattered, and the leads that covered it were taken clean away, and laid flat in the churchyard. The house of John Cray of that place received much and strange damages, which, together with his part in the sea-wall, amounted to five hundred pounds. Near the salt-works in the parish of Burnham was driven five trading-vessels, as colliers and corn-dealers, betwixt Wales and Bridgewater at least a hundred yards on pasture ground in the north march on the sides of bristol river near ken at walton woodspring the waters broke with such violence that it came six miles into the country drowning much cattle carrying away several hayricks and stacks of corn and at a farm at churchill near rington it blew down a hundred and fifty elms that grew most in rows, and were laid as uniform as soldiers lodged their arms. At Cheddar, near Axbridge, was much harm done in apple trees, houses, and such like. But what's worth remark, though not the very night of the tempest, a company of wicked people being at a wedding of one Thomas Marshall, John, the father of the said Thomas, being as most of the company was very drunk after much filthy discourse while he was eating a strange cat pulling something from its trenchard he cursing her stooped to take it up and died immediately at bruton what was most remarkable was this that one john dicer of that town lay the night as the tempest was in the barn of one john cellar 
the violence of the wind broke down the roof of the barn but fortunately for him there was a ladder which stayed up a rafter which would have fell upon the said john dicer but he narrowly escaping being killed did slide himself through the broken roof and so got over the wall without any great hurt what hurt was done more about that town is not so considerable as in other places such as blowing off the thatch from a great many back houses of the town for the town is most tiled with a heavy sort of tile that the wind had no power to move there was some hurt done to the church which was not above forty shillings besides the windows which was a considerable damage the lady fitzharding's house standing by the church the battlement with part of the wall of the house was blown down which tis said above twenty men with all their strength could not have thrown down besides a great many trees in the park torn up by the roots and laid in very good order one after another it was taken notice that the wind did not come in a full body at once but it came in several gusts as myself have taken notice as i rid the country that in half a mile's riding i could not see a tree down nor much hurt to houses then again i might for some space see the trees down and all the houses shattered and i have taken notice that it run so all up the country in such a line as the wind sat about one of the clock it turned to the northwest but at the beginning was at southwest i myself was up until one and then i went to bed but the highest of the wind was after that so that my bed did shake with me what was about windcanton was that one mrs gapper had thirty-six elm trees growing together in a row thirty-five of them was blown down in one edge hill of the same town and his family being abed did arise hearing the house begin to crack and got out of the doors with his whole family and as soon as they were out the roof of the house fell in and the violence of the wind took the children's headcloths that they never saw them afterwards at evercreech three miles from bruton there were a poor woman begged for lodging in the barn of one edmund penny that same night that the storm was she was wet the day before in travelling so she hung up her clothes in the barn and lay in the straw but when the storm came it blew down the roof of the barn where she lay and she narrowly escaped with her life being much bruised and got out almost naked through the roof where it was broken most and went to the dwelling house of the said edmund penny and they did arise and did help her to something to cover her till they could get out her clothes that place of Evercreech received a great deal of hurt in their houses, which is too large to put here. At Batcombe, easterly of Evercreech, they had a great deal of damage done, as I said before. It lay exactly with the wind from Evercreech, and both places received a great deal of damage. There was one widow, Walter, lived in a house by itself. The wind carried away the roof, and the woman's pair of bodice, that was never heard of again, and the whole family escaped narrowly with their lives. All the battlements of the church on that side of the tower, next to the wind, was blown in, and a great deal of damage done to the church. At Shipton Mallet was great damages done as i was told by the post that comes to bruton that the tiles of the meeting-house was blown off and being a sort of light tiles they flew against the neighbouring windows and broke them to pieces and at chalton near shepton mallet at one abbot's the 
roof was carried from the walls of the house in the house mightily shaken and seemingly the foundation removed and in the morning they found a foundation stone of the house upon the top of the wall where was a shoe in the ground of its being driven out at dinder within two miles of shepton there was one john allen and his son being out of doors in the midst of the tempest they saw a great body of fire flying on the side of a hill called dinder hill about half a mile from them with a shoe of black in the midst of it and another body of fire following it something smaller than the former there has been a strange thing at butley eight miles from bruton which was thought to be witchcraft where a great many unusual things happened to one pope and his family especially to a boy that was his son that having lain several hours dead when he came to himself he told his father and several of his neighbors strange stories of being carried away by some of his neighbors that have been counted wicked persons the things have been so strangely related that thousands of people have gone to see and hear it it lasted about a year or more but since the storm i have inquired of the neighbors how it was and they tell me that since the late tempest of the wind the house and people have been quiet for it's generally said that there was some conjuration in quieting of that house if you have a desire to hear any farther account of it i will make it my business to inquire farther of it for there were such things happened in that time which is seldom heard of your humble servant hugh ash our town of butley lies in such a place that no post-house is in a great many miles of it, or you should hear oftener. Sir, I received yours desiring an account of the damage done by the late great wind about us. At Will Snorton, three miles from Whitney, the lead of the church was rolled, and great damage done to the church. Many great elms were torn up by the roots, at helford two miles from us a rookery of elms was most of it tore up by the roots at kokiep two miles from us was a barn blown down and several elms blown down across the highway so that there was no passage a great oak of about nine or ten loads was blown down having a raven sitting in it his wing feathers got between two boughs and held him fast but the raven received no hurt at duckleton a little thatched house was taken off the ground penning and removed a distance from the place the covering not damaged hayrecks abundance are torn to pieces at whitney six stacks of chimneys blown down one house had a sheet of lead taken from one side and blown over to the other and many houses were quite torn to pieces several hundred trees blown down some broke in the middle and some torn up by the roots blessed be god i hear neither man woman nor child that received any harm about us your servant Richard Abenel, Whitney, Oxfordshire, Ilmister, Somerset, Brief but exact remarks on the late dreadful storms of wind, as it affected the town and the parts adjacent. Imprimus, at Axel Parish, three miles west from this town, the stable belonging to the Hare and Hounds Inn was blown down, in which were three horses, one killed, another very much bruised. Two, at Jordan's, a gentleman's seat in the same parish, there was a brick stable, 
whose roof, one back and one end wall, were all thrown down, and four foot in depth of the fore wall. In this stable were four horses, which by reason of the hayloft that bore up the roof, were all preserved. 3. At Sevington Parish, three miles east from this town, John Hutkins had the roof of a new-built house heaved clean off the walls. Note the house was not glazed, and the roof was thatched. 4. In White Larkington Park, a mile east from this town, besides four or five hundred tall trees broken and blown down, admiral to behold what great roots was turned up. There were three very large beeches, two of them that were near five foot thick in the stem, were broken off. One of them near the root, the other was broken off twelve foot above, and from that place, down home to the root, was shattered and flown. The other that was not broken cannot have less than forty wagon loads in it, a very fine walk of trees before the house all blown down and broke down the roof of a pigeon house the rookery carried away in lanes the lodge house damaged in the roof and one end by the fall of trees in the garden belonging to the house was a very fine walk of tall firs twenty of which were broken down five the damage in the thatch of houses, which is the usual covering in these parts, is so great and general that the price of reed arose from twenty shillings to fifty or three pounds a hundred, insomuch that to shelter themselves from the open air, many poor people were glad to use the bean, helm, and furse to thatch their houses with things never known to be put to such use before. 6. At Kingston, a mile distant from this town, the church was very much shattered in its roof and walls, too, and all our country churches much shattered, so that churches and gentlemen's houses, which were tiled, were so shattered in their roofs that, at present, they are generally patched with reed, not in compliance with the mode, but the necessity of the times. 7. At Broadway, two miles west of this town, Hugh, Betty, his wife, and four children being in his house, it was by the violence of the storm blown down, one of his children killed, his wife wounded, recovered. The rest escaped with their lives. A large almshouse had most of the tile blown off, and other houses much shattered. A very large brick barn blown down, walls and roof to the ground. 8. Many large stacks of wheat were broken, some of the sheaves carried two or three hundred yards from the place, many stacks of hay turned over, some stacks of corn heaved off the stattle, and set down on the ground, and not broken. 9. Dalish Walk, two miles southeast, the church was very much shattered, several loads of stones fell down, not as yet repaired, therefore can't express the damage. A very large barn, broken down, that stood near the church, much damage was done to orchards, not only in this place, but in all places round. Some very fine orchards, quite destroyed. Some, to their great cost, had the trees set up right again, but a storm of wind came after, which threw down many of the trees again. As to timber trees, Almost all our high trees were broken down in that violent storm. 10. In this town, Henry Duster, his wife and two children, 
was in their house when it was blown down, but they all escaped with their lives. Only one of them had a small bruise with a piece of timber, as she was going out of the chamber, when the roof broke in. The church in this place escaped very well, as to its roof being covered with lead only on the chancel. The lead was at the top of the roof heaved up, and rolled together more than ten men could turn back again, without cutting the sheets of lead, which was done to put it in its place again. But, in general, the houses much broken and shattered, besides the fall of some. This is a short but true account. I have heard of several things which I have not mentioned, because I could not be positive of the truth of them, unless I had seen it. This is what I have been to see the truth of. You may enlarge on these short heads, and methodize them as you see good. At Henton St. George, at the Lord Paulet's, a new brick wall was broken down by the wind for above a hundred foot, the wall being built not above two years since, as also above sixty trees, near a hundred foot high. At Barrington, about two miles north of this town, there was blown down above eight score trees, being of an extraordinary height, at the Lady Stroud's. As we shall not crowd our relation with many letters from the same places, so it cannot be amiss to let the world have at least one authentic account from most of those places where any capital damages have been sustained, and to sum up the rest in a general head at the end of this chapter. From Wiltshire we have the following account, from the Reverend the Minister of Upper Donhead near Shaftesbury, to which the reader is referred as follows. Sir, as the undertaking you are engaged in to preserve the remembrance of the late dreadful tempest is very commendable in itself, and may in several respects be serviceable not only to the present age, but also to posterity. So it merits a suitable encouragement, and tis hoped it will meet with such, from all that have either a true sense of religion, or have any sensible share of the care of providence over them, or of the goodness of God unto them in the land of the living, upon that occasion. There are doubtless vast numbers of people in all parts, where the tempest raged, that have the greatest reason, as the author of this paper for one hath, to bless God for their wonderful preservation, and to tell it to the generation following. But to detain you no longer with preliminaries, I shall give you a faithful account of what occurred in my neighbourhood, according to the conditions mentioned in the advertisement in the Gazette, worthy at least of my notice, if not of the undertakers. And I can assure you that the several particulars were either such as I can vouch for on my own certain knowledge and observation, or else such as I am satisfied of the truth of, by the testimony of others, whose integrity I have no reason to suspect. I will say no more than this, in general, concerning the storm, that at its height it seemed, for some hours, to be a perfect hurricane, the wind raging from every quarter, especially from all the points of the compass from northeast to the northwest, as the dismal effect of it in these parts do evidently demonstrate. In the demolishing of buildings, or impairing them at best, and in the throwing up vast numbers of trees by the roots, or snapping them off in their bodies, or larger limbs. But 
as to some remarkable particulars you may take these following viz one the parish church received little damage though it stands high the chief was in some of the windows on the north side and in the fall of the top stone of one of the pinnacles which fell on a house adjoining to the tower with little hurt to the roof from which glancing it rested on the leads of the south aisle of the church at the fall of it an aged woman living in the said house on which the stone fell heard horrible screeches as she constantly avers in the air but none before nor afterwards two two stone chimney tops were thrown down and two broad stones of each of them lay at even poise on the respective ridges of both the houses and though the wind sat full against one of them to have thrown it off and then it had fallen over a door in and out at which several people were passing during the storm and though the other fell against the wind yet neither of the said stones stirred three a stone of near four hundred weight having lain about seven years under a bank defended from the wind as it then sat though it lay so long as to be fixed in the ground and was as much out of the wind as could be being fenced by the bank and a low stone wall upon the bank none of which was demolished though two small homes standing in the bank between the wall and the stone at the foot of the bank were blown up by the roots i say this stone though thus fenced from the storm was carried from the place where it lay into a hollow way beneath at least seven yards from the place where it was known to have laid for seven years before four a widow woman living in one part of an house by herself kept her bed till the house over her was uncovered and she expected the fall of the timber and walls but getting below stairs in the dark and opening the door to fly for shelter the wind was so strong in the door that she could neither get out at it though she attempted to go out on her knees and hands nor could she shut the door again with all her strength but was forced to sit alone for several hours till the storm slackened fearing every gust would have buried her in the ruins and yet it pleased god to preserve her for the house though a feeble one stood over the storm five another who made malt in his barn had been turning his malt some time before the storm was at its height and another of the family being desirous to go again into the said barn some time after was dissuaded from it and immediately thereupon the said barn was thrown down by the storm six but a much narrower escape had one for whose safety the collector of these passages had the greatest reason to bless and praise the great preserver of men who was twice in his bed that dismal night though he had warning sufficient to deter him the first time by the falling of some of the ceiling on his back and shoulders as he was preparing to go to bed and was altogether insensible of the great danger he was in till the next morning after the daylight appeared when he found the tiles on the side of the house opposite to the main stress of the weather blown up in two places one of which was over his bed's head about nine foot above it in which two or three laths being broken let down a square of eight or ten stone tiles upon one single lath where they hung dropping inward a little and bended the lath like a bow 
but fell not. What the consequence of their fall had been was obvious to as many as saw it, and none has more reason to magnify God's great goodness in this rescue of his providence than the relator. 7. A young man of the same parish, who was sent abroad to look after some black cattle and sheep that fed in an enclosure, in or near to which there were some stacks of corn blown down, reports that though he had much difficulty to find the enclosure in the dark, and to get thither by reason of the tempest then raging in the height of its fury, yet being there, he saw a mighty body of fire on an high ridge of hills about three parts of a mile from the said enclosure, which gave so clear a light into the valley below, as that by it the said young man could distinctly descry all the sheep and cattle in the said pasture, so as to perceive there was not one wanting. 8. At Ashgrove, in the same parish where many tall trees were standing on the steep side of an hill, there were two trees of considerable bigness blown up against the side of the hill, which seems somewhat strange to such as have seen how many are blown at the same place, a quite contrary way, that is, down the hill, and to fall downwards was to fall with the wind, as upward was to fall against it. 9. One in this neighbourhood had a poplar in his backside, of near sixteen yards high, blown down, which, standing near a small current of water, the roots brought up near a ton of earth with them, and there the tree lay for some days after the storm. But when the top or head of the tree was sawed off from the body, though the boughs were nothing to the weight of the butt-end, yet the tree mounted and fell back into its place, and stood as upright without its head as ever it had done with it. And the same happened at the Lady Banks, her house near Shaftesbury, where a walnut tree was thrown down in a place that declined somewhat, and after the greater limbs had been cut off in the daytime, went back in the night following of itself, and now stands in the same place and posture it stood in, before it was blown down. I saw it standing the fourteenth of this instant, and could scarcely perceive any token of its having been down, so very exactly it fell back into its place. This is somewhat the more remarkable, because the ground, as I said, was declining, and consequently the tree raised against the hill. To this I shall only add, at present, that ten this relator, lately driving through a neighbourhood parish, saw two trees near two houses thrown besides the said houses, and very near each house, which yet did little or no harm, when, if they had fallen with the wind, they must needs have fallen directly upon the said houses. And eleven, that this relator had two very tall elms thrown up by the roots, which fell in among five young walnut trees, without injuring a twig or bud of either of them, as raised the admiration of such as saw it. 12. In the same place, the top of another elm yet standing was carried off from the body of the tree, a good part of twenty yards. Sir, I shall trouble you no further at present. You may perhaps think this enough, and too much. But however that may be, you or your ingenious undertakers are left at liberty to publish so much or so little of this narrative 
as shall be thought fit for the service of the public. I must confess the particular deliverances were what chiefly induced me to set pen to paper, though the other matters are considerable, but whatever regard you shew to the latter, in justice you should publish the former to the world, as the glory of God is therein concerned more immediately, to promote which is the only aim of this paper, and the more effectually to induce you to do me right, for contributing a slender mite towards your very laudable undertaking. I make no manner of scruple to subscribe myself. Sir, yours, etc., Rice Adams, Upper Donhead, December 18th, 1703, Rector of Upper Donhead, Wilts, near Shaftesbury. End of Section 8section nine of the storm by daniel defoe this librivox recording is in the public domain from littleton in worcestershire and middleton in oxfordshire the following letters may be a specimen of what those whole counties felt and of which we have several other particular accounts Sir, public notice being given of a design collection of the most prodigious as well as lamentable effects of the last dreadful tempest of wind. There are many persons hereabouts, and I suppose in many other places, wish all speedy furtherance and good success to that so useful and pious undertaking. For it may very well be thought to have a good influence both upon the present age and succeeding generation, to beget in them a holy admiration and fear of that tremendous power and majesty, which, as one prophet tells us, causeth the vapours to ascend from the ends of the earth, and bringeth the wind out of its treasures, and, as the priest saith, hath so done his marvellous works, that they ought to be had in remembrance. As to these villages of Littleton and Worcestershire, I can only give this information, that this violent hurricane visited us also in its passage to the great terror of the inhabitants, who, although by the gracious providence of God, all escaped with their lives and limbs, and the main fabric of their houses stood, though with much shaking and some damage in the roofs of many of them. Yet when the morning light appeared after that dismal night, they were surprised with fresh apprehensions of the dangers escaped, when they discovered the sad havoc that had been made among the trees of their orchards and closes, very many fruit trees, and many mighty elms being torn up, and one elm above the rest, of very great bulk and ancient growth, I observed, which might have defied the strength of all men, and teams in the parish, though assaulted in every branch with ropes and chains, was found torn up by the roots, all sound, and of vast strength and thickness, and with its fall, as was thought, by the help of the same impetuous gusts, broke off in the middle of the timber another great elm, its fellow and next neighbour, and that which may exercise the thoughts of the curious, some little houses and outhouses that seemed to stand in the same current, and without any visible burrow or shelter, escaped in their roofs, without any or very little damage. What accidents of note happened in our neighbouring parishes, I suppose you may receive from other hands. This, I thank God, 
is all that I have to transmit unto you from this place, but that I am a well-wisher to your work in hand, and your humble servant. Littleton, December 20th, Ralph Norris Middleton Stoney in Oxfordshire, November 26th, 1703 The wind being west by southwest, it began to blow very hard at twelve of the clock at night, and about four or five in the morning, November 27th, the hurricane was very terrible. Many large trees were torn up by the roots in this place, the leads of the church were rolled up, the stone battlements of the tower were blown down upon the leads. Several houses and barns were uncovered. Part of a new-built wall of brick belonging to a stable was blown down, and very much damage of the like nature was done by the winds in the towns and villages adjacent. William Offley, Rector of Middleton Stoney From Lymington Hasting, near Dunchurch in Warwickshire, we have the following account. Sir, I find in the advertisements a desire to have an account of what happened remarkable in the late terrible storm in the country. The stories everywhere are very many, and several of them such as will scarce gain credit. One of them I send here an account of being an eyewitness and living upon the place. The storm here began on the 26th of November, 1703, about twelve o'clock, but the severest blasts were between five and six in the morning, and between eight and nine, the 27th, I went up to the church, where I found all the middle aisle clearly stripped of the lead from one end to the other, and a great many of the sheets lying on the east end upon the church, rolled up like a piece of cloth. I found on the ground six sheets of lead, at least fifty hundred weight, all joined together, not the least parted, but as they lay upon the aisle, which six sheets of lead were so carried in the air by the wind fifty yards and a foot, measured by a workman exactly as could be, from the place of the isle where they lay to the place they fell. And they might have been carried a great way farther had they not happened in their way upon a tree, struck off an arm of it near seventeen yards high. The end of one sheet was twisted round the body of the tree, and the rest, all joined together, lay at length having broke down the pails first where the tree stood, and lay upon the pails on the ground, with one end of them, as I said before, round the body of the tree. At the same time at Marson, in the county of Warwick, about four miles from this place, a great rick of wheat was blown off from its stadles, and set down without one sheaf removed, or disturbed, or without standing away twenty yards from the place. If you have a mind to be farther satisfied in this matter, let me hear from you, and I will endeavour it. But I am in great haste at this time, which forces me to be confused. I am your friend, E. Kingsburg. The following account we have from Ferrum and Christchurch in Hampshire which are also well attested. Sir, I received yours, and in answer, these are to acquaint you that we about us came no ways behind the rest of our neighbors in that mighty storm or hurricane. As for our own parish, very few houses or outhouses escaped. There was in the parish of Ferrum six barns blown down, with divers other outhouses, and many trees blown up by the roots, and other broken off in the middle, by the fall of a large elm, a very large stone window at the west end of our church, was broken down. There was but 
two stacks of chimneys thrown down in all our parish that I know of, and these without hurting any person. There was in a coppice called Pupil Coppice an oak tree of about a load of timber that was twisted off with the wind, and the body that was left standing down to its very roots so shivered that it were cut into lengths it would fall all in pieces. Notwithstanding so many trees, and so much outhousing was blown down, I do not hear of one beast that was killed or hurt. There was on the down called Portston, in the parish of Southwick, within three miles of us, a windmill was blown down, that had not been up very many years, with great damage in the said parish to Mr. Norton, by the falling of many chimneys and trees. The damage sustained by us in the healing is such that we are obliged to make use of slit deals to supply the want of slats and tiles until summer come to make some, and so much thatching wanting that it cannot be all repaired till after another harvest. As for the sea affairs about us, we had but one vessel abroad at that time, which was one John Watson, the master of which was never heard of yet, and, I am afraid, never will. I have just reason to lament her loss, having a great deal of goods aboard her. If at any time any particular relation that is true come to my knowledge, and any convenient time, I will not fail to give you an account, and at all times remain your servant, Henry Stanton, Ferrum, January the 23rd, 1703-1704. Sir, in answer to yours relating to the damages done by the late storm in and about our town, is that we had great part of the roof of our church uncovered, which was covered with very large perfect stone, and the battlements of the tower and part of the leads blown down, some stones of a vast weight blown from the tower, several of them between two or three hundred weight, were blown some rods or perches distance from the church and twelve sheets of lead rolled up together, that twenty men could not have done the like, to the great amazement of those that saw him. And several houses and barns blown down, with many hundreds of trees of all sorts, several stacks of chimneys being blown down, and particularly of one Thomas Spencer's of this town, who had his top of a brick chimney, taken off by the house, and blown across a cart road, and lighting upon a barn of Richard Holloway's, broke down the end of the said barn, and fell upright upon one end, on a mow of corn in the barn. But the said Spencer and his wife, although they were then sitting by the fire, knew nothing thereof until the morning and a stack of chimneys of one Mr. Embers fell down upon a young gentlewoman's bed, she having but just before got out of the same. And several outhouses and stables were blown down, some cattle killed, and some wheat ricks entirely blown off their staffles, and lighted on their bottom without any other damage. This is all the relation I can give you that is remarkable about us. I remain your friend and servant, William Mitchell. At Ringwood and Fording Bridge, several houses and trees are blown down, and many more houses uncovered. From Oxford, the following account was sent, enclosed in the other, and are confirmed by letters from other hands. Sir, the enclosed is a very exact and, I am sure, 
faithful account of the damages done by the late violent tempest in oxford the particulars of my lord bishop of bath and wells and his lady's misfortune are as follows the palace is the relics of a very old decayed castle only one corner is new built and had the bishop had the good fortune to have lain in those apartments that night he had saved his life he perceived the fall before it came and accordingly jumped out of bed and made towards the door where he was found with his brains dashed out his lady perceiving it wrapped all the bedclothes around her and in that manner was found smothered in bed this account is authentic i am sir yours j bagshot december ninth seventeen o three sir i give you many thanks for your account from london we were no less terrified in oxen with the violence of the storm though we suffered in comparison but little damage the most considerable was a child killed in st giles by the fall of a house two pinnacles taken off from the top of magdalen tower one from merton about twelve trees blown down in christchurch long walk some of the battlements from the body of the cathedral and two or three ranges of rails on the top of the great quadrangle part of the great elm in university garden was blown off and a branch of the oak in magdalen walks the rest of the colleges escaped tolerably well and the schools and theatre entirely a very remarkable passage happened at queen's college several sheets of lead judged near six thousand pounds weight were taken off from the top of sir j williamson's buildings and blown against the west end of st peter's church with such violence that they broke an iron bar in the window making such a prodigious noise with the fall that some who heard it thought the tower had been falling the rest of our losses consisted for the most part in pinnacles chimneys trees slates tiles windows etc amounting in all according to computation to not above a thousand pounds oxford december seventh seventeen o three from kingstone upon thames the following letter is very particular and the truth of it may be depended upon sir i have informed myself of the following matters here was blown down a stack of chimneys of mrs cooper widow which fell on the bed on which she lay but she being just got up and gone down she received no harm on her body likewise here was a stack of chimneys of one mr robert banford's blown down which fell on a bed on which his son and daughter lay he was about fourteen years and the daughter sixteen but they likewise were just got down stairs and received no harm a stack of chimneys at the bull inn was blown down and broke way down to the kitchen but hurt nobody here was a new brick malt house of one mr francis best blown down had not been built above two years blown off at the second floor besides many barns and outhouses and very few houses in the town but lost tiling some more some less and multitudes of trees in particular eleven elms of one mr john bull's shoemaker about thirty apple trees of one mr pierce's and of one john andrew a gardener a hundred apple trees blown to the ground one walter kent esq had about twenty rod of new brick wall of his garden blown down one mr tyringham gentleman likewise about ten rod of 
new brick wall blown down. Mr. George Cole, merchant, had also some rods of new brick wall blown down. Also, Mr. Blytha, merchant, had all his walling blown down, and other extraordinary losses. These are the most considerable damages done here. Your humble servant, C. Castleman. From Tewkesbury in Gloucestershire, and from Hatfield in Hertfordshire, the following letters are sent us from the ministers of the respective places. Sir, our church, though a very large one, suffered no great discernible damage. The lead roof, by the force of the wind, was strangely ruffled, but was laid down without any great cost or trouble two well-grown elms that stood before a sort of almshouse in the churchyard had a different treatment the one was broken short in the trunk and the head turned southward the other tore up by the roots and cast northward divers chimneys were blown down to the great damage and consternation of the inhabitants and one rising in the middle of two chambers fell so violently that it broke through the roof and ceiling of the chamber and fell by the bed of mr w m and bruised some part of the bed teaster and furniture but himself wife and child were signally preserved an outhouse of mr f m containing a stable mill-house and a sort of barn judged about forty foot in length standing at the end of our town and much exposed to the wind entirely fell which was the most considerable damage not one of our town was killed or notably hurt though scarce any but were terribly alarmed by the dreadful violence of it which remitted about five in the morning the beautiful cathedral church of gloucester suffered much but of that i suppose you will have an account from some proper hand this i was willing to signify to you in answer to your letter not that i think them worthy of a public memorial but the preservation of w m his wife and child was remarkable your unknown friend and servant john matthews tewkesbury january twelfth seventeen o three and four bishops hatfield december ninth seventeen o three sir i perceive by an advertisement in the gazette of last monday that a relation of some considerable things which happened in the late tempest is intended to be printed which design i believe will be well approved of that the memory of it may be perpetuated I will give you an account of some of the observable damages done in this parish. The church which was tiled is so shattered that the body of it is entirely to be ripped. Two barns and a stable have been blown down. In the latter were thirteen horses, and none of them hurt, though there was but one to be seen when the men first came. I have numbered about twenty large trees blown down, which stood in the regular walks in the park here. It is said that all the trees blown down in both the parks will make above a hundred stacks of wood. A summer house, which stood on the east side of the bowling green at Hatfield House, was blown against the wall, and broken, and a large part of it carried over the wall beyond a cartway into the ploughed grounds a great part of the south wall belonging to one of the gardens was levelled with the ground though it was so strong that the great part of it continues cemented though it fell upon a gravel walk several things which happened inclined me to think that there was something of a hurricane part of the fine painted glass window and my lord salisbury's chapel was broken though it looked towards the east 
the north side of an house was untiled several yards square. In some places the lead has been raised up, and over one portal quite blown off. In Brocket Hall Park, belonging to Sir John Reed, so many trees are blown down that, lying as they do, they can scarce be numbered, but by a moderate computation they are said to amount to above a thousand. The damages which this parish hath sustained undoubtedly amount to many hundred pounds, some of the most considerable I have mentioned to you, of which I have been in great measure an eyewitness, and have had the rest from credible persons, especially the matter of Brocket Hall Park, it being two miles out of town, though in this parish. I am, sir, your humble servant, George Hemsworth, M.A., curate of Bishop's Hatfield in Hertfordshire. The shorter accounts which have been sent up from almost all parts of England, especially to the south of the Trent, though we do not transmit them as large as the above said letters are, shall be faithfully abridged for the readier comprising them within the due compass of our volume. From Kent we have many strange accounts of the violence of the storm, besides what relate to the sea affairs. At Whitstable, a small village on the mouth of the east swale of the River Medway, we are informed a boat belonging to Ahoy was taken up by the violence of the wind, clear off from the water, and being borne up in the air, blew, turning continually, over and over in its progressive motion, till it lodged against a rising ground about fifty rod from the water. In the passage it struck a man who was in the way, and broke his knee to pieces. We content ourselves with relating only the fact, and giving assurances of the truth of what we relate, we leave the needful remarks on such things to another place. At a town near Chartham, the lead of the church rolled up together and blown off from the church above twenty rod distance, and being taken up afterwards and weighed it, appeared to weigh above twenty-six hundred 